This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everybody and everyone wherever you are in the world and a very warm welcome to a sunset drive and we're coming to you live from the Masai Mara Triangle in Kenya and my name is David, that has not changed and with me on camera is Manu, my apologies, Manu good morning, no Archie good morning, yes 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 I have been with Manu for the last few days and I just like to call Archie for no good reason, Archie I'm sure gonna uh, forgive me for that. And we are here in the Masimara with a herd of elephants just grazing and feeding. Remember, this is a very interactive safari we are doing and you're welcome to ask questions. Should you have any comments, you may give them on using hashtag safari live on Twitter. Such a warm day for us, 28 degrees Celsius and 83 degrees Fahrenheit. That a young female just marching and I'm assuming that is her youngster behind her. And to all of you, Jumbo right back, Jumbo right back from the Masai Mara Triangle in Kenya. Nice day to start with elephants. I've always said any day you see elephants, a good day. So there's a small family here, not a very big and this closely related. They could be sisters or first cousins with your young ones. Trying to get that plant and feeding on it. One of doing a very good job. So elephants will always grace and they'll also browse at the same time. And we're having now at the very end of the migration, so the elephants will be very happy to be on their own. There's a small little baby there behind that termite mound. And I might sit here a little bit more, yes, until that baby comes out. And that's the second baby there. But in the meantime, there's a gentleman who always have much bigger smile than me in South Africa. And would like to say, Jumbo, to all of you. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari. I am Sydney Pumulani Mikosi and I am traveling with Sezo and hopefully we will give you the best wildlife experience ever. I am very glad to hear that uh, the migration is about to end there by the Masai Mar. Something that I'm looking forward to see as I have never experienced that before. My plan this afternoon is quite very easy. I will be looking for the buffaloes as well as the Unkuhuma Pride. And for your questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. J Jumbo David, nah, inventor. <laughs> so I'm hoping to learn a little bit of uh, Swahili. <laughs> So it's looking very much quiet at the moment. Hello, hello again. And here where I am, I can see that the uh, tracks, they are not much clear at the moment. And the weather is excellent, but the sun is very strong at the moment. So this is the area I have been this morning as well. I was looking for uh, the uh, beautiful cat Hosanna in the area, but now let's go to Tristan, who also got something at the moment. Well, no, I don't actually. I've just got myself driving down a road and I've got David on camera. So as Sydney said, my name is Tristan. It is very, very nice to have you all aboard on Rusty this afternoon. Hopefully we're going to have a slightly more successful afternoon 
then we did morning. Our morning was good in terms of Ellie's, but we struggled a little bit with everything else. And so we're going to try and exact some revenge on those that are spotted, both hyena and leopard, and try and find them. Got lots of good leads to go on. There was apparently some Nyala barking around Galago Pan, which I'd imagine would be for Hosanna. And then there was also a late showing of Tingana this morning, apparently around nine o'clock-ish, um, very close to between sort of Philemon's and Rebecca's. So we're going to try and scratch around for the old Duke to start with. I'm just checking Treyas Pan quickly to see if he's maybe come down for an afternoon drink. It's a quite a, I mean it's not hot but it is warmish and so maybe he's sought some water during the course of the day and has come and lay up near the pan. So that is the plan for this afternoon. Hopefully it will be a successful one. David, what do you think? David says yes, it will be a successful one. All right, David, let's see how successful we can be. Hopefully, this old boy is lying up. I, sh I shouldn't call him an old boy. He's looking very good at the moment. But, you know, he is getting older as the days go by. And so, hopefully, he's lying somewhere in this general vicinity. Now, I've always got to kind of look out carefully because... Often with Tingana at Trias Dam, he's not like Hosano who used to lie right at the dam edge. He used to find, he always finds himself a kind of bush a little bit further away and then just lies in under the bush there. So you've got to be a bit careful when looking for Tingana because sometimes he cannot be where you think he would be and you kind of drive right past him. But I see we've got a saddle built stalk and not a leopard here at the moment. So maybe he hasn't come down to this area just yet. Oh, there's hardly any water as well, so it's going to be one of these days soon where we're not going to see anything coming to Trias. Let's see here. Right, now there is literally no water there, so I doubt much is going to be able to drink from that. There is the saddle-build stalk that I was referring to, and I wonder if this is the same one that we've been seeing around Buffel's hook. Now you can see its beak is all dirty because it's been trying to stab it into the mud to get all kinds of frogs and whatever else is trapped in, in the drying sort of cracks of the mud itself. And so it's quite common to kind of see that on these guys when they do feed off drying water holes is their beautiful red beak takes on a much more dark tone because like I say, it just gets covered with horrible mud. But it is a male, so I would imagine it's the same one as at Buffelsook Dam. I think, you know, Sydney's going to head up towards Buffelsook Dam, so maybe he'll kind of be able to tell us if the other one is up there, because it'd be very cool if we had two different males on Juma. You know, there's not that many saddle-built stalks in the Greater Kruger region. There are a few, but I mean, it's, it would be nice to have two different male birds on the sort of property. And it's only because these pans are drying, they're just making use of it. and. It really astounds me that we're sitting here at a dry treehouse dam. I mean, you can't really call that a pan anymore. There is a bit of water, but it's, it's pretty much not even a meter by a meter anymore in terms of the width of that actual water on the surface. The rest is just a mud mess, and I don't think you're going to find any cat drinking from that at the moment that is as dry as you could imagine. So. Scott, you said that stalk needs to go to Chitwa. Well, I, yes, I suppose for clean water, yes, but in terms of actually finding food, these drying pans are the best places for them because the prey that they are trying to find has got nowhere to go. So it's got no escape route. In Chitwa, it's very difficult because there's a lot of space and you know things can get away from a bird quite quickly. Also, it's got to worry about things like crocodiles, whereas in a pan like this, it's really a buffet actually for a stork. And so you'll find that they'll actually enjoy walking around in these kind of areas and utilizing these small pans. So even though it doesn't look great from our point of view, it's absolutely perfect if you are a saddle build stalk because you're going to be able to find all the food that you need. Now there's a go away bird that is shouting. Why are you shouting, go away bird? Can't see it, but it's making a noise behind me. Now they'll often shout if there's some sort of predator around. It could be obviously a bird of prey, it could be a slender mongoose, it could be tingana, it could be anything. So we're going to try and see where and what's causing this go away bird to be a little bit upset but while we do that we're going to send you all the way back up to the Masai Mara with David who's enjoying a big pachyderm herd. Go away birds are very good in giving away any concern and the uh, uh, we've got different types of go away birds uh, in South Africa and the ones we have here in Kenya 
But apparently elephants are never bothered even when they would hear go away birds because not much of predators would bother them because of the huge size. Still sitting here with my herd of elephants and I'm sure I have said this before and I'll keep saying it, saying it again and again that elephants are my favorite animals because you'd sit comfortably with an elephant like this one here feeding and just enjoy the way she approaches the plants, the leaves. See that young one there? Jay will tell you what, elephants do not like wildebeest and they do not get along. To me, wildebeest are very noisy and they're very loud and I'm sure, Debbie, you know, elephants, unless for a reason, they really trumpet or they really make any calls. So the migration affects the elephants a lot and you will notice they really mix. Elephants do anything they can to avoid the wildebeest, especially if they have their young ones. And as the wildebeest are just so many and they go pooing everywhere and then go nee, 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 nee. and elephants being very quiet animals and maybe not wanting a lot of irritation, they do anything they can to make sure they do not cross path with the wildebeest. Apparently there be now the migration is almost gone. What we have now is the final tale of the migration. They are all heading back to Tanzania and I'm sure the elephants will keep enjoying what they've been enjoying without the interruption of the wildebeest. Now we're going to leave this herd as much as they're going away from the forest. I thought they would come closer to the shade of these trees, but because it's cooling off, I doubt now they need the shade. This is the youngster I wanted to see earlier, but still hiding on the other side of the mother. And she is trying to move forward and I'm sure she is learning a lot from the mother in terms of feeding. Now, we'll be moving away from my elephants in Kenya to moo or other elephants in South Africa. I have got the elephants here in South Africa now from the elephants in Kenya. So I'm not sure if maybe the one uh, with David is way much older than this. Uh, this one already knows how to use the trunk, you can see. Uh, this one is feeding by him or herself. Very difficult to tell the gender at the moment from where I am. So these elephants, they are always together. It's quite a very small group. I saw them now for a couple of days. So they are very much closely related. So the elephants, they stay in herds. This is what is called a parade of elephants is a head of elephants. So I can see that now they are trying to move away. I'm just going to pull forward so that you can have a lovely, better sighting. Rosalind, the elephants, they don't have sharp teeth. The elephant teeth is a so very 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 lovely they are in blocks they are not sharp they are in blocks and they can be able to deal with this kind of uh, hard materials from the vegetation so they are very much amazing teeth and they are so very thick so you can see the little one is trying to pick up some sand and when they're throwing the sand on their bodies is when they're also trying to um, cool the body temperature. They use both the ears and they also cool the body temperature from the sand. So you can see these elephants are feeding but they are also going under the shade. Daniel, the elephant babies, they don't get chased away from these kind of groups. So because they stay in families, all the closely related members stay together. So the little ones, they are born and they suckle the milk together. And then after that, they are still going to be part of the very same family. They don't single out females to establish their own heads. So the competition is not too much here by the elephants. So these elephants can be able to eat a lot of vegetation a day. 
<laughs> Kimberly, I have been charged by the elephant before. And I've been charged by the elephant on both guided walks and game drives. So I used to work by the Maraka National Park, uh, which is a park near Tabazibi. There, one day, the elephants, the, I was on a game drive, and these elephants were feeding very much relaxed. And there was no sign of... of, of uh, of irritation there and then he just picked up the branch and threw the branch to my vehicle and from there he started chasing me I had to reverse very quickly unexpectedly so elephants can be so very much unpredictable so these elephants they've got to eat for about 400 kilograms a day that is quite a lot of vegetation but they don't digest everything, so they will only digest 48%. That is why, if you look, the evidence on the droppings, you still have got very strong hard material. So the elephant's droppings can be used in order to make some papers. Erika, the, the elephants, the, when they are getting old, that is when they are starting to lose their teeth and that shorten their life expectancy. So these kind of animals can survive for about 65 years. But when they are over 55 is when they are starting to lose their teeth and chances of them to survive much longer, they get very restricted by the losing of teeth. So you can see that if it doesn't have teeth, it's going to be difficult for them to feed. This kind of vegetation is so very much hard for these elephants to deal with. So now let's go to uh, Tristan, who is now with uh, the sleeping Tingana. I am indeed. He's although he's just popped up his head now and decided to wake up a little bit. So I think we're going to have a probably a fairly relaxed afternoon with him to start off with, and then sh hopefully we should start to see him wake up a little bit later in the day when the sun just gets a little cooler. Then he should hopefully start to get going. But you never know with Tingana; he can sometimes walk at the most random times and move around all over the place. And so it'll be worth sticking with him, particularly because he hasn't eaten in two days, which means means that he'll be hungry and so hopefully this afternoon if things move around near him we might see him actually get up and do some hunting also I'm pretty sure he's going to try and get some water during the sort of end part of the afternoon and so it'll be worth just sticking around with him and seeing what he gets up to but really nice to kind of find him early on in the afternoon we know Tingana has a reputation for popping out at the last minute, although lately his reputation has changed a little bit. He's actually been fairly good to us. We've been seeing a lot of him during the sort of start of the drives and spending quite long periods with him. Since he's returned from his sort of illness, he tends to kind of show up in more convenient times, to be honest, rather than showing up right at the, the last kind of bit of the drive. So it's been nice to spend a lot more time with our Dukies. Obviously, kind of resurged back into this sort of leader of this area and, and has stamped out Hukumuri to a degree and is, is in the process of kind of trying to keep other young boys at bay. But he's kind of come back to our stronghold, if you want to call it that. You know, at one point he was pretty much just on Chitwa and then when before that, when he was very healthy, he used to roam around all over the place. I mean, we used to track him into Arethusa, he's got a Bufus Hook and Torchwood, all over, a little Gauri. Whereas now his movements, while he does go into those places other than probably Arethusa, it's not as far as it used to be. And he tends to come back to Juma more and more and more. And so, you know, we've been so fortunate that we've spent a lot of time with him in the last few months. And whether or not that effect is because Osana has been around. Oh, big boy, are you tired now? He is now sleepy. All right. Now you can see Tingana has gone from at least looking like he might be a little bit awake to completely fat and sleepy. So we'll have to sit and be patient and see what he gets up to. But while we do that, let's send you back to David, who's got something with a lot more energy than our male leopard. Well, it's very typical for cats in the heat of the day just to keep enjoying their snooze. But we've got monkeys here that you call the velvet monkeys. Velvet monkeys. 
and I'm trying to recover from calling Achimanu and he's reminding me a better name for them is the blue ball monkeys and you can see what Achi is talking about definitely that is a male and when they're mating or when they would go into what you call breeding season those blue balls get very very deep blue sometimes navy blue they'll be up on that tree looking either for worms or for gums that is the magic Nguare tree and it may have some gum on it and that's what they'll be trying to dig out or some berries look at that one oops see how high it goes jumps up hello there so it's magic Nguare tree and they could be looking for the berries of the magic Nguare not ripe at the moment not even the green ones I can see that is a youngster and I think she's just full of energy she's just maybe trying to show her mother how far she can jump and in future one day when she'll be on her own the mother will not be worried of her youngster she'll know she can be independent and live without worries of any concerns on the ground the biggest concerns being snakes sometimes baboons baboons are bigger monkeys and they have been known to attack them Rosemary I couldn't agree with you father on your comment and look at that one there Rosemary she he rather because it's definitely I was talking about the blue balls he is just there and I think he is showing off and I agree I want to respect him as a good looking male cute not sure what exactly he is looking at maybe the youngster who went up could be his son or daughter and waiting for him or her to come down in one piece because the tree is quite high or just having a rest about monkey or are you hiding something there what would happen she, he could be sitting on something and he doesn't want the rest to know and until they all move away he's going to start to devour it maybe he discovered some chicks because some of these holes on these trees we got birds that will nest on these trees or maybe he found some eggs and he wants everybody to leave before he can start eating. We see like that big hole there. That tree is different from where he is and that is a fig tree. And you see those holes either having dennet cuts living in there or hornbills laying in there. Take care. I do not know how to explain that. I might be finding out what exactly causes that blue coloration but apparently I have known these monkeys having that blue coloration take care and only when they're mating Achi 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 is laughing I don't know what why he's laughing Achi do you have an idea Achi swings his head and I learned about the blue ball monkeys first from Achi take care my apologies I'll be finding out what causes that but the only thing I can tell you when they're mating in say a group or trip of these monkeys as we would call them there's always a dominant one sometimes you might call him the alpha male when they're mating the balls swell they get bigger the testicles and they're very deep blue sometimes as i said navy blue and he has all the rights to mate and what he does he'll always go on top of a tree like that he's got to put his legs apart and he'll display his testicles to the females and all the females you know He'll be meeting with them so to take care i have no idea how that ended up to be in blue and should i know i'm sure you're always tuning us tuning on we'll show you this small little baby somewhere let me see if archie can get it so, sorry hang on for a second oh yes archie got it well done well done archie magic look at the size of that baby she's so tiny you might mistake her for a bush baby that's the size of a fully grown bush baby i'm sure she's playing hide and seek either with the daddy or mom down there see how small she is well done archie for spotting that i've always respect you there's something special with monkeys with archie how he's able to maneuver and do his magic work with the camera shanyu monkeys are omnivores and just like us they will feed on anything green i'm talking about leaves 
twigs, small little branches, but also they are like carnivores, also like you know, an envoy do. They'll get worms, they'll get insects, any small little baby antelopes they get on the way, they will feed on it. Butterflies, if they get any moth, locusts, grasshoppers. So monkeys in general are primates, they are omnivores, and they'll just feed exactly like us. I don't know if that baby has disappeared or are you things still in there? So from where they are now, I just want to believe they are either getting some gum from that tree or some small little berries from the magic guare tree. And sometimes they'll open the back of the tree and if they get any cocoons of butterflies or moth, they will feed on them. If they get any caterpillars also, they feed on caterpillars. Very good. They're just jumping around there and just feeding. And those holes, like what we saw on that right there, Archie, that huge hole on that fig tree, should there be any birds, you know, uh, nesting in there, they'll always sneak in, get the eggs out. I'm talking of like oxpeakers. Oxpeakers have been known to be nesting on such holes or huge trees. Nobody home at the moment. Well, well done, Archie. Well done, monkeys. Let's find out how the Duke of Juma is doing at the moment as we move on to find out for something else. Well, at the moment, he's fast asleep, and I think he is pretty happy that there's no monkeys around him because otherwise they'd be shouting at him, making an awful lot of racket, and probably irritating him quite intensely. So I'm pretty sure our male leopard is very happy that there is no vervet monkey bouncing around in the trees near him. Not that there are many trees for a vervet monkey where we are currently. Actually, talking about vervet monkeys, I had a bit of a another. We have. A bit of a vervet monkey problem, should I say, at camp at the moment. We have two or three vervet monkeys that think that they're very clever and that are quite young and a little bit naughty, if that's the right word for it, and they are becoming uh, more and more naughty as the days go on. It's becoming a little bit of a problem, actually. We're starting to get them running into the kitchen, and this afternoon, just before we headed out, I went to go and get some water and just generally stock up on a few snacks that David and I generally take on drive, and... Um, the monkeys were being their belligerent selves as normal as they were playing a game of taunt Tristan as they tried to kind of run in and out of the kitchen while I was standing there. And then, uh, you know, there was a few snacks that were lying around, not of mine, but of others. Um, particularly, the camp has a favorite blueberry rusk that is apparently very delicious. And so there were some blueberry rusks that various members of staff were squirreling away for FC shift and uh, the monkeys saw a gap and they took two of the blueberry rusks and they ran away which was not you can imagine how upset many people were with the fact that the the special rusks got taken not the normal ones but anyway so it was this Alex says she was so sad. It was Alex's rusks. She said she was very sad. I saw the sadness in her eyes and the kind of life drain out of her as her precious rusks were stolen by these naughty monkeys. But this is what they do. They just go on and on and on. And it's it's quite hectic to watch them. Conrad the other day had the most insane experience with the vervet monkeys. He said he was in the kitchen watching this vervet monkey being full of nonsense and bouncing around trying to get into the kitchen and he says he was watching from inside and there was a little hornbill that was sitting right close to the kind of window outside and this monkey apparently ran up and grabbed the hornbill and then hit it against the table and then dropped it and left it and ran away which is i thought very naughty as not nice at all yes because he asked conrad about it the monkey hit picked up the hornbill and hit it against a table and then ran away and left it which i thought that's very cheeky from a monkey. So this is what we're dealing with. That's the level of cheekiness that currently is kind of bestowing us in camp. And so it's quite funny also in the morning meetings to watch Brent Leo Smith try and be a monkey himself and chase them around and try and sh sort of throw things and, and try and get them to stop coming near the food and he's uh, actually having a losing battle because there's about four monkeys to one Brent Leo Smith and I know Brent Leo Smith is as active as a monkey at times but he definitely is not winning the battle when it comes to the vervets at the moment so we have our hands full and it's a no leaving food outside policy at the moment 
Yes, yes, indeed, Kirsty. They might. That's maybe why, is they maybe think he's part of the family, and that's why they're not perturbed by his antics and his behaviour. But <laughs> anyway, so, you know, it's it's at the moment is all all hands on deck. Food watch. Got to lock up the kitchen every day. Um, otherwise, they become a handful. They've even worked out how to unclip a lid on a bin and open it and then there is a massive war that rages if a bin gets opened there is a war that rages between dwarf mongoose squirrel vervet monkey and hornbills and it's 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 like piracy out there they each squabble and steal from one another the other day a monkey trapped a vervet i mean a vervet monkey trapped a dwarf mongoose in the bin and there was much squealing and going on and then the rest of the dwarf mongoose came and then the monkey ran away and it's just complete it's complete chaos um, that goes on. Obviously, Tingana is not even interested in my story. He's just dreaming about not having to deal with these things, and that's because Tingana doesn't have to have these vervet monkeys kind of in his space. I wish we had a pet leopard. We need to get Tingana or Hosanna to come and lie by our kitchen for a few days. That will sort the monkeys out, especially if they chase one and get them out of our camp. But it's definitely not ideal the way the monkeys are being at the moment, but it at least provides us with some entertainment and some stories that we can tell every now and then. So Lily, who's seven years old, hello Lily, I hope that you're well. Um, you're asking how many monkeys are in a family group? Well Lily, it depends on, on the area, so monkey group sizes can vary quite a bit depending on how successful they are, how much food is available. Um, at the moment this particular troop that we see, we very seldom actually see the adults, it's mostly um, a group of delinquent teenagers, so naughty boys that come along and, and girls that are probably like a sort of 12 to 14 year old human about that age and they're the ones that are coming in and they're raiding the kitchen every day we don't see the adults too much so I'm not sure how many are in their particular little grouping um, but generally when you see monkey troops in in this particular area normally anywhere between sort of 15 and 20 that would be a good size for a vervet monkey group sometimes they can be smaller you know, it can be only five or six of them sometimes it can even be as many as 30 40 of them in the same area but generally the vervet monkey groups are much smaller than what you would see from the baboon groups. The baboon groups tend to be a much larger grouping than what you see from the vervet monkeys, but they can be a bit of a pain, both of them, to be honest. So it's been a monkey kind of war at the moment, and they will be the, at their worst at this time of the year. The reason why they're so bad now is because there's very little food for things like vervets and baboons. You know, both of them would like to eat um, fruits and those kind of things, and we know we're right at the back end of winter now, so it's the driest it's going to be. There's the least amount of food possible, and so that's why they're resorting to try and finding food in bins and those kind of things where there's, you know, this attractant of a smell of, of food that they're just really struggling to find out in the actual bush. And, and it's it's a problem at every single camp that I've ever worked at is monkeys and baboons they, and hyenas. The three of them cause a lot of havoc. Um, and so you kind of constantly play these games of trying to keep out three of the most, well, three of the cleverest animals out here from raiding and getting into lodges. And you're really in trouble if you start to get the honey badgers involved because when they start coming, then there's really a lot of nonsense that goes on because they are incredibly strong and seriously determined little creatures. There was a friend of mine that used to work at a lodge and he said the one day they went into the kitchen and the honey badgers um, managed to actually eat their way through a steel fridge door and made, managed to actually to get it off the hinges and then get themselves into the kitchen so they were quite something anyway talking about interesting things I mean obviously honey badgers are something we don't get to see all that often we also don't get to see small spotted cats all that often and it sounds like David up in the Masai Mara has found one of those small spotted cats well, from Tingana, the spotted cat in Juma, we got a different cat here, a spotted cat here that's quite difficult to see. Uh, difficult in the sense that it's very nocturnal and you rarely see them during the day. And this is a savo cat. They always walk in the grass looking for chicks or eggs of birds. And Cassie says, this is awesome. I don't remember the last time I saw a savo cat. Very many times when I was in college, I used to call them baby cheetahs. Until my lecturer would tell me the difference in terms of sports and in terms of behavior. 
and I'm very happy you're all excited to see Savoca. It's quite a new issue. There's a small little bird there. Not sure she's thinking of that bird or her eggs. She's going round and round in that particular area, and there's a small little bird there. I'm guessing it's a cisticola. Look at her long neck. You rarely see them walking in open areas, always in the grass, unlike the cheetahs. You know, I was talking about what my lecturer told me. Uh, one big difference in behavior between several cats and cheetahs is the cheetahs will tend to walk in very open, clear areas, but several cats will always walk through the grass and for the obvious reason, looking for food. See the white behind their ears and it's like a line and like a spot. What cheetah would have and then if you look carefully just on the back on the hind the front quarters it got like lines very similar to what we would see on the king cheetah king cheetah is like a subspecies of the normal cheetah that we see again remember this is a very interactive safari we're doing should you have any questions please send them Catnap, yes, apart from going for chicks and eggs, and they'll also go for reptiles. I'm talking about, what's that there? I'm talking about um, lizard or skins. They also go for insects. I'm talking about grasshoppers, about locusts. So we want to turn around and see how lucky we might be. So they also eat insects because when they walk there, what happens? The insect will keep jumping up and down, and when they jump, they will definitely jump with them and just grab. These cats have been known to jump very high if they just walk in the grass and a bird jumps up, they've been known to leap just like that to catch whatever they want to. But did you see where she went? Okay, let's just get a little closer to her. It's quite a very special sighting for us and see what she's feeding on. So insects is one part of the big diet, boats, Skinks, lizards, reptiles, snakes. And here she is. We're coming very close to her. And she doesn't seem very skittish, which could be a good sign. Is that good, Archie, there? Okay. Archie is happy with that. I might be a bit soft to make sure I don't scare her. And she's just, I think to me, hunting and looking for food. Look at those, like, black lines. Unlike the hindquarters, which got spots like of a cheetah, if you look on the back from the front quarters, they're like continuous black lines. And that's exactly what I was saying you'd see on king cheetahs. And how beautiful to see the black or the white on the ears, on the back of the ears. So that way any bird that jumps up, they've been known to jump. A very cut, another cut that's closely related to this in terms of behavior is the caracal. The caracos being a little bit bigger in size and having tufts of fur on top of the ears. Very majestic. And like most cats, always on their own, very solitary. Unless, of course, you get a male or female, male and a female, or a mother with her young one, or young ones. always walking through the grass. Very unusual to see them walking in open areas which will not have anything for them to disturb or to feed on. So should a grasshopper jump up there or a locust, they'll definitely bring it down and feed on it. Carla, I agree with you. Look at the ears, look at the size of the tail. But this makes a big difference between the cheetah and this savocat here, because cheetahs have, I would say to me, a bit longer tails. And cheetahs will use or will need those long tails to be able to turn around as like a rider when they run for speed. But I highly doubt the savocat may need such a long tail, because they do not run to get their food. They'll just walk casually in the grass. And there she is. Did you find yourself some food there? What are you doing on that tarmac mound there? Is this a stocking mode? Do you want to pounce on something? Maybe yes, maybe not. 
youngest will let you know that she's just watching. And what a beautiful cut and how lucky for me and Archie to see a Savo cut that I've not seen for quite some time. And you'd imagine if anything would come out of that hole would most likely be a peak like a warthog and not anything she would even dare to try on. But she's just looking at something that personally cannot see, but these cats got very good uh, eyesight. Maybe in the middle of the grass there is something she can see. See how she is twitching her ears. It's a bit windy though, but nothing I would say to bother her in terms of hunting if that's what she is t trying to do there. Small little swallows flying on top of her and I think they are disturbing his, her plants. See how, how, they move, how the ears move. And the ears are very important for them to locate, to locate She's on the move again. That's the Savocat. And we come into you live with the Maasai Mara Triangle Game Reserve. But Savocats are solitary, just like most cats are. Cheetahs, leopards, caracus, this ones too are very solitary. The only social cats we got in Africa are lions. Remember, keep sending your questions through, or if you have any nice comments, like saying how beautiful she looks in the middle of the you know, windy grass there, as the wind just moving the grass, you're more than welcome. You can use hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. See how you can easily mistake her from the hindquarters as to be a cheetah. But you see, the cheetah has so many white marks on the tail, but this is more of brown and black and no white on the tail at all. Much bigger nose than of a cheetah if you look carefully. And definitely smaller in size. Jasmine, I would say this is a fully grown one, about a feet up from the ground and maybe two feet in body length, Jasmine. This is a fully grown one. And the moment maybe, Jasmine, you see one on its own that is independent, it's definitely fully grown and it can just feed on itself. I want to move forward a little bit and see where she might be ending up and how exciting this is. Eh? The times when you see this very rare cats, it becomes quite exciting. And hopefully, she might catch something for herself. I was just saying before, when you see them feeding on birds, they tend to leap up in the air like that as they jump onto their foot. As she walks, she stops, and every minute she stops, definitely she's turning to look around to see if there's something she can feed on. We just were lucky we saw her jump up from the grass and she went down. We could have easily have missed her because of how well she blends in in the grass. Eh? All right, there she is. And they always feed, stop, and just make sure they are not spotted by their would-be prey, like birds. Brandon, I highly doubt that would happen. We haven't or haven't seen many people who have been researching on savocats, maybe to understand them better. And genetically looking at them, I do not know what cut I would compare them, you know, domestically back home, you know, in our homes. So, Brandon, I highly doubt that would be done. And for anyone maybe to keep them in cages, I do not know whether there are zoos in the world that have them. But I would say for me, it could be rather difficult to domesticate them because they are not understood very well. And as I initially said, they rarely come out or they are rarely seen. So that has not given the researchers maybe enough data or weapons to know whether they can domesticate them at home or not. Unlike the cheetahs, you've seen people in some parts of the world, you know, domesticating cheetahs, but several cats I have not seen. I would still say 
we still got very limited information about these cuts. Hello. You see it going a little like collar, like of a leopard. And that's one closeness, I would say, between it and the leopard. And like the cheetahs, which do not say have collars below the neck, you can see like it have like a necklace, a black one. Very good job, Archie. So we would say it's what, half leopard, half cheetah, half king cheetah, half something else? I'm looking at the three cats, you know, that are sported. This one, the leopard, the cheetah, Karako definitely not. And even asked between the three, I would like to maybe cast you send a poll to the viewers, cheetahs, leopards, and the several cats that we're just watching now. Ask them what could be the most beautiful cut of the three. The one we're just watching now, the Savo cut, cheetahs that we all know, leopards that we all know. In terms of spot, which one could be their favorite? I'm going to give them one more chance to have a look at that Savo cut, then that will give them a good feel before they send the answers. So just tweet using hashtag Safari Live, and I'm sure at the end of the poll, Cass will tell us between the cheetah, the leopard, and this Savo cut here. Who do you think is the most striking cut? I'm gonna move forward a little bit. Can you see it, Archie? Oops. Archie decided to leave the Savo cut and go to a small little bird. And maybe she might have lost a few eggs, hopefully not. And this is called the yellow throated long claw. Yellow throated long claw. She's looking for some insects to jumping up. And because of the wind, she keeps following any insect that's being blown by the wind. All right, I am still in love with that cut because I want people to give a very fair feel of what cut they think is most beautiful of the three that I mentioned. So she hasn't gone very far. She's very cooperative. They're always very shy. Ivy, I'll tell you what, I'm sorry. I've even never heard a Savo cat making any sound or any call. I'm going to try to imitate one, but I can tell you, I have no idea, Ivy, what calls they make. Ask me about the cheetah. I know for a fact, leopards, yes. But again, this cats being very nocturnal or when you see them during the day, you just see them for a couple of seconds sometimes, then they disappear in the grass. I do not know. Maybe I may be asking Tristan later on or Sydney to tell me what call do they think the Savo cats make. And maybe the day I see them or see her, for example, with her cubs, that might help if she'll be calling the cubs in the grass or she'll be maybe calling a partner. legs like ask with you i agree with you 100 percent she's moving away i don't know why she wants to go there's one particular spot she keeps going and not sure what is there either there's some eggs or some chick chicks she's trying to get and every time she gets there the mother of these chicks come around or the owner of these eggs come around not sure it was the long uh, the yellow throated long claw we just saw or not but again, there she is. That's one particular spot. Actually, let me know when to, spot, to stop. And how exciting to just to have her. Well, from what I'm getting from Castile, like everybody say leopard number one in terms of beauty of the spots, and then Savo number two, and then cheetah number three. Well, I'll agree with you, leopards are so very beautiful. You just saw one with uh, Tristan, the Duke of Juma Tingana. But let's have a look at this cut again. You might change your mind, but as it is now, the poles are leopard number one, servo cut number two, cheetah number three. I don't know how far cheetah is, whether it's a distant three or pretty close to the servo cut. But well, for me, I do not know what to say. Look at the beauty of that. It looks like of mixed genes, like a hybrid of two cuts. See how different the sports are? The hind quarters and the back quarters are very different. Like continuous lines behind the head and the neck. And the sports of a cheetah, 
one of the hindquarters. How beautiful is this? That particular spot she is now is where I was saying either she can see some eggs and she wants to keep them. Shannon, I would say yes. In general, I would say yes. And they are always different. Not 100%, but I would say they are a little different this way or that way, depending on the genetics or depending on which male fathers the young one. I would say they are always very different. I don't know whether we could come up with a way of identifying different avocats like we do the leopards, but I would say that would be very difficult. They do not have the chin spots like we have on leopards. And either way, spotting a savocat is big news. So I do not think that would happen. But I would say, Shannon, what I would say is they'll definitely have some slight differences. Well, I don't know. Actually, I want me and you to vote. And you tell me at the end of this, is it the savocat, the cheetah, or the leopard? Look at that beauty. I do not want to influence my feeling to anybody. But I'm seeing like two different cuts in one. Typical posture for cut. Stop, look before going. And you can see on the inner side of the leg the black stripes they got, which makes it very colorful. I think every part of the body has a different pattern of spots. I don't know where else you'd see savocats in the world apart from Africa. You know, like like cheetahs and leopards, you'll see them in Asia and outside the world, like, you know, mountain leopards or snow leopards in the Americas. I'm trying to think, apart from Africa, where else would the savocats be? Very majestic. I think she's just ruling the whole of this area of the savannah. There's nobody else. Remember, as I said earlier, should you have any questions or comments, send them through using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. James, who are you? And that's a great question. And I'll give you a great answer. I have no idea. I'm not sure that my answer makes sense or not. But again, as I said before, not many people who have had interest to follow the Savo cuts because they are really seen. And I would guess you might see one and say in one day you have seen two. You might see two and you think you've seen the same one. Now, I just should hop and jump up there in the air and I'm not sure to jump to kill something or not. Let's have a quick look on it. Did you kill something? She just went up and landed on something. I think she's feeding on something. She must have got herself something. Well done. Are you st still trying to strangle it? What is that? Oh, she got herself something. Wow, she got herself something. Is it a mouse? Is it a lizard? Is a mouse? Yeah, because it's a mouse. Yes, she just went up and she came down. Very well done. This is my first hunt I've seen over Savocat. Very well done. They love rodents and mice is part of it. Very well done. You must be a very good hunter. I've not been able to identify whether it's a he or a she, but my guess from a distance is, did you just drop it? What did you do? Or did you swallow it? What did you do there? Either she didn't like it. I don't know. You do not work that hard and you just decide to drop your dinner. Well, to me that does not make any sense. But maybe she did not like it, did not taste it very good. And she'll be going to try and get another one. Who knows? All right. She swallowed it. Whew, that was fast. Oops, are you marking territory there? Just praying there. Actually, did you see her swallow it? I just missed that. That is very interesting. How fast was that? Eh? Excellent. Now, let's see if she'll catch another one and maybe swallow. That was too fast. I even missed that. I was still enjoying her, like, grabbing it and trying to push it in the mouth. Ha! Huh. 
It's very interesting what might have happened to that mouse, but that was a bit mysterious to me. It could have been very fast. Let's see if you go around her and see whether she's going to make another jump. Choop, choop. Come down and grab another rodent. Okay. All right. Hopefully she dropped it. Let's because I would have been surprised how she would have swallowed it without me seeing it. Let me see. Let's see if they can see another view of her. And to the face. Hello there. Savo Cat, you are beautiful. We really want to thank you so much for giving us such great profile. Beautiful ears. Great marks. The village I come from, I have always seen people painting their ears black and white when we have this celebration like during harvest time or during weddings and I do not know whether they might have borrowed that from the Savocat because it's exactly similar to what I'm seeing here and this has reminded me some couple of years back in my village when we had some big wedding ceremony going on and we had black and white on the ears of many people and especially the bride and the groom I'm going to be finding out from my grandmother whether they might have borrowed that from the Savocat or where they got that from. But this pattern that I'm seeing on the ears on this Savocat remind me of that. She might decide to pose there and sometimes pose for anything to come across. A prey like a mouse. If there's maybe a little trail there for mice, she might just stay there quietly. And if, say, a mouse will come running there, she'll very quickly grab it. How beautiful cat this is. But I think there's another cat in South Africa, which unfortunately could be a bit sluzy. Indeed, David. If only Tingana was showing the same prowess as our serval except for the fact that the serval didn't eat what it actually caught, which is quite unusual. But how epic and exciting is that? You know, for us down here in South Africa, a serval is a very, very uncommon animal to see. And so, yeah, I'm sure David had the most epic sighting by the sounds of it, which I'm very jealous about. Although when I was in the Mara, we actually saw, I saw quite a few servals while I was there. Had a very cool sighting with Manu the one night after, I don't remember what happened that day. We had a crazy day that day. I think we had seen... We'd seen everything. I mean, we'd seen leopards and lions hunting and cheetah hunting and all kinds of things. And then we were on our way home. It was about, I think it must have been about half past 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. And we were on our way home from sitting with the musketeers all night. And um, we managed to see a serval kind of walking down the road. And we thought, well, maybe it will do something. And as we kind of said that, it, Manu managed to get it all on camera as it pounced. Tingana, you've got a thorn tree stuck to your head. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a thorn tree stuck to the top of his head at the moment that he's kind of dragging around. A little buffalo thorn that's hooked into one of his rolls that he has on his head. You know, Tingana's got so kind of much like a sausage that his rolls have gotten so big that the thorns are even hooking into it. But we managed to get this little serval and, and pouncing and jumping and grabbing a little mouse right next to us. It was very, very cool. In fact, I remember now it, was the, it, was the, it wasn't the musketeers. It was the day that we had the sausage tree pride bringing down the buffalo and that morning we had watched a cheetah hunt and, and grab a, a tommy as well so it had been a really kind of good day and we had seen a leopard up a tree so it was kind of the three cats and then we got a serval on the way home also hunting which is pretty cool so it's really something special about the Mara is that you do get these serval sightings and even ones during the day which obviously here is almost not heard of is very seldom that you're going to see a serval during the day in this area but the flip side is that we get leopard like this which is not as common up in the Mara system as it is down here and so we're very fortunate in that we get to spend time with our snoozy duke even though he's being a bit lazy at this stage i'm pretty sure he's going to be fairly active later what is interesting is that he ate so much over the last kind of period when he was sitting on those two carcasses that he's actually still fairly full even though he hasn't eaten for almost sort of well maybe he has eaten something but he definitely doesn't we don't know of him being on a carcass the last two days but his belly is still quite round and rotund but I would imagine that he's going to be marking as well as looking out for food. We know he doesn't like his belly to get too small while the sort of winter period is around. And so I'm pretty sure he's going to be hunting. But you can see nice, big, deep, slow breaths, which means he's not even that hot. There's a nice breeze that is blowing. And he's found himself a perfect little spot besides the thorn tree attached to his head uh, to kind of rest 
and sleep and take it easy. You can see he's got a nice quarry tree that's providing the perfect shade for him. And so everything is very, very cool. <laughs> you see, Nick, you are probably quite right in that every day is a lazy day for Tingana. He thoroughly enjoys sleeping and napping. And, well, who can blame him? I mean, he's had, you know, 12 years of moving around and trying to kind of stay safe and protect an area and become dominant and all of these kind of things. So I suppose he's earned his rest, hasn't he? He's kind of done all of those things. And, and, and now it's just time to kick back into retirement phase and take it very easy and revel in the fact that she's the biggest and baddest of the male leopards in this particular area and so no need for him to really actually move around too much and, and doesn't have to really kind of do too many things to be active. And what's so interesting with him and, and what's quite incredible is with you know, you, you th always see him like this on days when it's hot and he's not really doing much. And you think to yourself, you know, he's, he's getting a little older. But then you watch him, like in that sighting we had with, with Tandi Tlalamba and Hosanna and that hyena, and you realize that this guy still commands a lot of respect. The way that he ran in there and every other animal in that entire scene just scattered. There was just dust clouds. There's hyena, Hosanna, Tandi, everybody just gone from the area um, you still realize how much respect he still commands and how much of a force he can be and the way he ran in to grab that um, Nyala was one of a very assertive very energetic male and and you could see the the way he approached in the way and compared to the way Hosanna approached is why the, uh, the hyena had this the reaction it did to the two different leopards it stood its ground to Hosanna because he kind of creeped in a little bit unsure of himself whereas Tingana just ran in there full speed and stood over that carcass like he owned it and then that obviously pushed everybody off pretty quickly so you know even though he does have lazy days when he is active he certainly puts on quite a performance and quite a show and you must understand he also does a lot of walking around at night and scent marking so i suppose he's earned his daytime nap good now we're going to wait for him to wake up from his slumber you can see he's twitching and dreaming at the moment and hopefully that means he's dreaming about going hunting just now but one animal that has been hunting as we know is the serval and david i think is still with it and i wonder if it's gone back to its mouse in order to eat it Well, hopefully Tingana, you rise up and shine, and this avocado just rose up, and she is shining again, moving around, and I think she had just had a commercial break on feeding after enjoying all the insects around here, the mice or any reptiles she can catch for herself. The most interesting drama story I remember with this avocado was sometimes back last year when I saw one near a wet pan and she was trying to hunt herself a frog just on the edge of the wet pond, but maybe not taking chances on the depth of the wet pond. I said, just want to make one little turn here. Let me just reverse a little bit, Archie, for you. And tell me when you're happy, Archie. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Are you happy, Archie? Keep coming. What do you mean, Archie? I have to stop now. All right. And she was trying to hunt herself a frog it was like early in the morning and the water was cold it was not very hot you know she was full of energy and she saw a frog jump in the water and she jumped in to catch the frog but apparently when she came out of the water she came out with a fish I mean that was a bit mysterious just like my mouse today not knowing whether she swallowed it or she dropped it but at that particular time she was trying to hunt a frog a frog that they saw very well the frog jumped in the water and the savo cat also jumped in the water she jumped in to catch the frog but when she came out she was eating fish and myself and my guests were like mm, we do not understand a frog jumping in the water and changing into fish so i do not know Chris, I'll tell you what, Savo cats are some of, of all the small cats I know in Africa, Savo cats have the longest legs. And that gives them an advantage of being to leap in the air. You see what she's doing now? That's like a hunting mood or a stalking mood. And Chris, if you're lucky, I'm sitting here with her a couple of more minutes. We just saw her sort of catch a mouse. So if she leaps in the air, it's always exciting. It goes like a little semicircle and and lands down and lands on whatever she is preying on
And I think the whole idea to me of jumping up, coming, landing down is just to increase the momentum because as she lands down, she has the speed and the weight and that traumatizes the prey. It's easy now for her because they're not very strong cuts. Very long legs they got, as I said earlier. Hello there. And you see the black like coming from their eyes over the way to the nose, not exactly like the cheetah, because the cheetah ones they hunt during the day. Anna Marie, in general, they'll always have two to three cubs, Anna Marie, two to three cubs, but do not be surprised when you see one with five. In general, two to three, but the times they have been spotted with five cubs. Anna Marie, let me move much closer, and if we find out if she's a female, we may also be finding out if she's pregnant or not. So two to, two to three cubs, but times we have seen them with five cubs. She's blending in very well in the grass and she's on and off and at times disappearing from us. But this particular area, there must be something that she loves because she has stuck here for the last almost, I would say, 45 minutes. How's that touch? Is that good? Keep going. Hello, Savokat. That's good, eh? Okay. Now, I want her to turn around and face us, and you're going to compare her black marks with the ones of a cheetah, because hers do not come on the face. They seem to come on the side, like where leopards got the chin spots, which means they do not hunt in general when it's very out of the strong sun, because the cheetahs will use the black tear marks. You see that? Little, little different, little similar, but it's not a continuous line all the way to the nose. Cheetahs are very conspicuous uh, black tear marks. And yes, Cassie, this is truly beautiful, and the closest I've been to a Savo cat that is very cooperative. She looks to be in very good uh, body physical condition. And they cannot stop talking of those stripes on the neck there. I don't know what would happen to it at old age when, you know, she passes on. I think they got a lifespan about 15 years or so. And this skin would be very good to put in a museum. Or if the lions would get it, they'd maybe put it in their den to just keep enjoying and seeing it. I do not know what part exactly of this particular cut I would say is beautiful than the other. Look at the front part, it's very, a little bit light in color than the back. What do you see for yourself? I got a feeling the wind is affecting her hunting behavior. But look how she moves her ears like a radar. And they like satellite dishes to pick any slight sound because one of the defenses is to pick or one of the defenses just to take off if there's any concern. So she keeps turning her ears in different directions and the wind definitely is not helping here. Flex one left here. Maybe could be irritated by a fly, maybe not, or it could be a leaf flex. Minimum, my guess, is 15, 16 years. That could be the lifespan of these cards. I'm just remembering, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking, yeah, could be, yeah. An average of 15 years is the lifespan of these avocats, Minamu, and always very exciting to see them. And apparently that translates to them living slightly bit longer than cheetahs. And cheetahs are bigger in body size. I wouldn't know how to explain that, but Minamu just live a little bit longer by maybe two or three years than the cheetahs. 15, 16 years is ideally the lifespan of this cat. I want to move a few more meters in front and see whether I can get a better view of her face and not to interfere the direction she is facing to. Maybe she got plants of hunting. And what I want to see is the belly and some beautiful black stripes she got on her legs just by the elbow. If you look carefully, see the white belly there.
And Kaz, very good to hear you're in love with Savocat and hopefully we shall be able to support them every other day for you. I mean, if I was to be one of the viewers and I was to give a poll on the beautiful one between the cheetah, leopard and the Savo, I would from today be like you and say the Savo cut. I mean, look at that. How those spots, the pattern, how different and how unique. It's like an artist came there and just painted this cut. And the artist was thinking different patterns depending maybe on his or her mood. Some continuous lines, some V's, some spots, small rosettes. Look at the tail. It's like designed like a leaf. How beautiful sitting down again. You want to lay some ambush there? They're going to be laying an ambush there maybe for another mouse. Or a lizard. Not sure you can get any frogs there. You need to go near water. She just blends in very well and she disappears in that grass, which is very typical of caracos and savocas like this one we have here. Sydney is still working very hard and I'm sure he is trying to get a cut somehow by hook or crook. Good luck, Sydney. I am still looking for some cats here where I am at the moment. And there's just tracks everywhere. These lions this morning, they were just going everywhere in this area. So I can see that these tracks are now heading towards the direction where I am coming from. So I've got to turn here and keep following and see where they are resting this afternoon. And if I don't make it here by the lions, I will carry on and see if I can find the little chief Osana. So the lions, they prefer to sleep long hours. So maybe they are somewhere here by this grass. There's been quite a lot of uh, activities happening here and different prize were making noise and one of the coalition as well was roaring. So I'm not too sure if they decided to go to uh, Buffalo's Hook, the private concession, or they are back in the property. And all this were happening uh, running about half past seven, eight. So the sun was already strong. So I think maybe the sun, sun discouraged their movements this afternoon. See, this, the tracks here are all showing that they're all tracks for this morning. No fresh tracks yet. They are looking fresh, but for this morning. Some of them. Some of them crossed here, which is towards the direction of Buffalo's Hook. So I must have to change the road now and see if these tracks are going to come out from the other side. So some of them are still here on this side. So the Unkuma Pride is considered for quite a lot of uh, family members. Yeah, I am still following. I can see they are still on the road here. So now let's uh, go to Tristan, who is lucky with a spotted cat, Tingala. Indeed we are, Sydney, and hopefully you'll get some luck with your tawny cats at some point. Oh, hello, Tingana. Yes, good afternoon. Big yawn. And are you going to roll onto your back and then... Your head is still stuck to the thorns, you silly boy. Oh, and he's decided he's not going to roll over because he's got a thorn attached to his head, but he's also not going to get it out. I'm quite intrigued to see when he stands up if it's going to come with him and if it's going to get stuck on his coat. Don't look at me like I'm being nasty to you. You're the silly fool that's got the thorn tree stuck to your head. 
silly cat. Anyway, while he's now gone back to sleep, it is that time of the day where we are going to do Tracking Tuesday. Even though it's Wednesday, we did Tracking Tuesday yesterday, so we would have posted a track um, every Tuesday. We do it on Safari Live Official on Instagram, and it's for all of you to try and participate and to try and guess exactly what track we posted, and you can all kind of comment there and give your answers, and then on a Wednesday, we go through everything. So it's a really kind of fun and interactive thing, and I hope lots of you are starting to participate. This week was an incredibly difficult one, and I'm not surprised that I don't think anybody actually got this one right. But essentially the track was this, I will show it all to you, I do apologize if my screen is a little bit dirty, I also need to get rid of that. Um, so that is the track that you are looking at, it's these lines that you see on the right side of the actual kind of Leatherman there. And so that is what we were looking for. Now, what would have confused a lot of you with this particular track is that that is actually an upside down track. So what you would have need to have done is you would have need to have actually looked at it. Oh, come on, turn now. So it would need to be like that. That's the actual way that this track is facing. So the back of the track is actually on this side and the top of the track is that side. Now, it's tricky because this one was in very, very difficult sand and the animal that we were looking for is not one that we see all that often, particularly not its tracks. Now, many of you guessed monitor lizard to start off with. So this is what a monitor lizard track looks like, this one on the right hand side. This is an actual size for a monitor lizard track and you can already see that this track is way, way, way too big. A Leatherman, for example, if I put my finger out, that is about the length of a Leatherman. And you saw that those tracks were one third of the length of a Leatherman track, whereas look at this, or this length of a Leatherman itself, whereas you can see this back foot is pretty much as big as my finger, if not bigger. The other thing also with monitors is that they have claws on the front, so you see very obvious claw marks. Marks. you'll also see this line that you see going through the middle is the tail dragging so a monitor lizard will always have a tail drag as it goes through the sand which was not evident in that particular track and the best bit of advice that I can give you is that this Leatherman is of a standard size so that's why we're putting it next to the track is so that all of you can kind of use it as a reference of scale and a reference of size and so when you see that then you've got to try and kind of think about the foot that's making that and the relevance or the reference to the size of the Leatherman. I think we worked out that the Leatherman was what did we say? I think it was like four inches is what we said. A lot of you also said Egyptian goose. Now Egyptian goose, the sort of pattern that you would have had would have been so both somewhat similar. You know, it was that kind of triangular sort of look to it, but it's because everyone was looking at it from the wrong way around. Uh, you also would have found with an Egyptian goose where it was on the road was probably not a good indication, but you didn't have any of these sort of circular shapes and there was definitely no webbing visible on that particular track at all. That track had different digits, it did not have um, a webbing and it was also more than three toes on that particular track and you didn't have this little toe that comes off the back. Now this is of a spur wing goose but an Egyptian goose is just a smaller version of this particular track. Pretty amazing that that's actually the actual size for a spur wing goose foot. Now the answer to all of this was one that I actually did it live and so that might give it away to some of you but it is this on top. A lesser bush baby is actually what that track is. This is a track that Herbie and I sat and we ummed and aahed and went over and over and over and over again and trying to figure out what was going on. But what I'm going to show you is if you have a look at this track upside down, right now, sorry, I'm going to try and show it that we can actually see it a little bit better. So if you have a look at it upside down there, you see these very prominent kind of V sort of markings that you're getting at the back of the pad. If you look on this one here, on the sort of actual scan of it, there's that V marking that we were looking for. And so basically what's happening is in this particular track, the thumbs are coming out. These toes on the front were not clearly visible at all in this particular track. The thing about a bush baby is it's a bipedal hop as it says there and so the feet are right next to each other and that's what would have given this track away is that if you look on this particular picture you can see both tracks are side by side so there's the one foot the right foot that's the left foot there's that V and the thumbs are just inside there so there's the one thumb and there's the other thumb going up on the top and that's what would have made this a bush baby a very 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 difficult track this is not a track that you would easily get right in fact none of the crew that I asked from 
that photo would have known it was a bush baby. In fact, even Brent and Jamie were not sure until I told them. Peggy, you said you would never have guessed that from that particular photo or even guessed that particular animal. Exactly, it's not a track you see very often. Um, it, we were just very lucky that it was actually bounding down the road and we had a series of them that we could look at and it's why we eventually concluded that it was. That was a very tricky photo. I took it specifically for Tracking Tuesday because last week you guys absolutely hammered us and you all got it right and so well lots of you got it right and so we thought this week we'd come back and try and test you a little bit more the other thing with the bush baby track that's always quite nice to look for especially on a hard sort of surface is that you must remember that they have actually got um, this sort of shape right on the front so sometimes what you'll see is you actually don't really see the toes very nicely but you'll see this kind of almost like a baseball mitt kind of shape to it that you look for so sometimes the toes don't register very clearly but this baseball mitt kind of shape does and so that's what you would look for now that is the actual size of the track so I'll put my finger next to it oh. That's what happens when we talk about tracks in the company of Tingana. He is not impressed. He's, uh, the, the intention must be on me. I don't want you talking about tracks while I'm sitting here. You all need to focus on what I'm doing. Now, of course, it's not that. He's just intentionally sawing in order to make everybody know that this is his area. And it's a good sign because when he starts to saw like this, it's generally an indication that he's going to wake up and move and decide to actually start thinking about going on a territorial patrol. Very seldom will you find that male leopards will spend long periods of time actually um, sitting down and sawing. A lot of the time they'll saw like that and then that's the time to get up. Now you can see he's got his nose to the air and he's just sniffing. I wonder if there's something on the breeze that he's caught that he's trying to maybe kind of attract or to send a message to. Could be very well be Tundi that he's picked up a scent for because this is where she was before they all interacted on that kill. So maybe she he's picked up her scent and that's why he's just sawing a little bit and making everybody kind of know he's in this area. But that was very, very cool. I love hearing a leopard saw. Now these big yawns are very indicative that he's thinking about waking up. I wouldn't be surprised that we start to see him stand fairly soon and actually start to take us on a walk. The interesting thing is, is he is facing north at the moment, which is going to hopefully drag us up towards Viatela Camp and maybe to the pan there, which will be nice. So for those of you that watch the dam cam, hopefully he'll end up in that area. But I definitely think he's not going to be sleeping for too much longer. I think he's starting to think about moving. It's cooled down quite a lot. The sun is getting to a really nice angle now, and so it's the perfect time for Tingana to start thinking about his afternoon patrolling to go around and just basically kind of scent mark and get everything sorted out. But he's been very vocal. I believe yesterday Seb was telling me that they, him and Sydney, followed him around yesterday afternoon. He was calling every five minutes. And so he's obviously picking up a scent of somebody around here, whether it might be that female that's in Estrus, could also be that, you know, he's just making sure that Hosanna knows he's the dominant individual, or there's another male that's been sneaking around that's making him a little bit agitated, and that's why he's kind of constantly sawing the way that he did. When he was up near Buffalzook Dam yesterday, I'm pretty sure he was sawing because we had tracks for another male leopard there, and it wasn't in Ghana because we knew he was on the kill. How awesome is that? That is so, so cool. It's amazing. There's impalas that are alarm calling that can't see him. They can hear him, and they're actually alarm calling in the <coughs> distance. Unless there's another leopard here, um, he's making a lot of noise, and the impalas are not impressed that there's a leopard so close. But you can also see he's salivating a little bit, which is interesting. I wonder if he's not smelling somebody in this area or some other cat in this section. We're going to do a bit of grooming first before we before we go for a walk. Now, grumpy old man, you say, well, yes, he got the branch off his head. He did. He, all he did was with one swipe of his paw, as he sat up, he kind of got rid of it, and that was the end of that. He didn't actually have to worry too much. It wasn't as hooked in as I thought it might be. It luckily, he didn't get into the little ear flesh, because that would have made it a little bit more tricky to actually get out. But yes, he's managed to not have 
a huge thorn tree in his head, which is always quite nice. It would have been very funny to have watched him walk around with a thorn tree attached to his head for a bit. I say funny as long as it wasn't hurting him or obstructing him in any way, but it would have just been comical for a few kind of steps to see it just dangling off him and to see whether or not he actually cared. But, of course, leopards are meticulous about their looks, and so he got rid of that quite quickly and now he's going to make sure that he looks very good before he starts to walk and pose for all of us because that's the next kind of mission for Tingana is to go and sort of pose around on the roads and walk around and scent mark and call and just generally show off quite a bit so I think we're in for a little bit of a treat this afternoon with Tingana as he goes about his business so I certainly am looking forward to it I think we're going to have a really kind of a special afternoon. Yes, Tingy, we're talking about you. Doesn't he look magnificent, though, for an older male leopard? I think he's looking fantastic these days. I mean, I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, he's been sleeping most of the time we've been here, so I'm not sure what his poor injury looks like. Um, I would imagine that it's still there. I'm hoping that it's feeling a little bit better. I'm pretty sure we'll get the kind of full extent of what's going on when he gets up and walks. He's obviously going to be a bit stiff and a bit sore when he first starts to walk, um, and he'll walk that out pretty quickly. So once we've been with him for about 15, 20 minutes of him actually walking, we'll get a better idea of how that injury is affecting him. But there we go. Standing up now. No, not too bad. He is not really. He's got his paw lifted, the one that's got... Tingy, have you seen something that we haven't? Because he keeps looking in that direction. I wonder if maybe another male leopard hasn't walked around here and has irritated Tingana immensely, and that's why he's so kind of vocal about what's going on. Now, we're going to try and keep up with him. It's going to be very tricky where he's walking, but obviously we're going to try and do it and see what we can actually kind of get out of all of this, but it's not going to be an easy following, that's for sure. Right, now, while we kind of keep up with Tingana and see which way he's going to head, let's send you back across to Sydney, who's got another of Africa's iconic animals. Oh, look at that. This is quite a very beautiful animal. I've got the zebras here, so they are just quite a few at the moment. They are working together with the impalas, and we just found them doing a very interesting behavior. They were doing some dust bathing. So the big animals as well, they come on the roads, and they roll and play in dust in order to get rid of the parasites. So look at these beautiful stripes and the stomach looks very much big. If you disturb this zebra now as he's standing, he's going to release quite a lot of gas. And when releasing the gas uh, is when they are going to run away from the danger. But the release of the gas has got nothing to do with antipredation. So they release gas just because the gas is too much in the stomachs. Is there in order to assist them when they are digesting the food. So this is one of the animals which has got a very good eyesight. And they bite. So you can see there that they is trying to show off the teeth a little bit. Before the zebras fight, you can see, normally they provoke each other from just the simple body gesture. You will see they pull their neck forward and they extend their neck and pull ears forward and show off the teeth. If another one does the same body gesture, it's when a very big fight is going to take place. So the big males, the stallions, they are responsible of these uh, zebra families. It's called a harem, where we have got one breeding male in charge of the several females. But the young males, the cult, for them to establish their own families, they must fight and corner a few females and then have their own families. So now I can see that they're disappearing. I'm just going to pull further and see if maybe we can improve this sighting. Monique, they have got a very interesting alarm call. Sometimes that call confuses me uh, when it comes to the call of the hornbills. So the hornbills and zebras, if you, 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 you listen to them very carefully, early in the mornings you will hear that the, the, the sounds are alike.
So you can see one of them is just coming to join from the other side. So this one looks very much clean. So these are one of those animals who are standing a better chance when it's too hot like this because uh, the white colors on these animals reflect the heat. So the black colors there absorb the heat so they can be able to survive. So this is one of those animals with a very good kick and turn mechanism. They've got one solid hoof and this one solid hoof can be very much dangerous. Look at that. So they are all looking at the side. Niko uh, Niko, zebras, yes, they are falling part. They are falling under a group of the order which is called Perisodactyla. The Perisodactyla is those animals that has got a simple stomach. So if you look at the characteristics of the zebras and the horses, as well as the, the donkeys, they all got one hoof and they've got a simple stomach. So they are falling under this perisodactyla. So in order to see the difference between the male and females, if you are at the back, you must check when they're waving the tail, the male has got a very thin line, thin black line going down, whereas the female has got a broad uh, line going down. So all the zebras, they look pregnant. So because all year round, they, 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 they look in a very good condition. So these animals, when they are not in a good condition, is very much difficult to tell. So now I'm just going to carry on and see if we can find something by the Buffalo's Hook Dam. It's very much difficult to find the cats this afternoon. The sun is still very much hot. So I can see quite a lot of evidence on the roads showing that these animals has been rolling a lot here. Yeah. I think the road has just been recently graded, so that's why these zebras are coming here for uh, dust bathing. So now uh, let's go to the Masai Mara. David is also driving around in order to find you something. Wow, that was very exciting to have the Isabo cat with us earlier. And I decided to leave the Isabo cat and come to this. Actually gonna give you a small little swing of the area we are in, just a little pan of this area, not very far from where we are, Archie. And this is the I'll call the Masai Mara Triangle Savannah. Excuse my head. And you see how open it is, and the grass is very short. And all this was done by the wildebeest. As you've seen, the sun, they're going down. So this area is always very good for cheetahs. And this is a cheetah country. And what I want to look for now, if I'm lucky, is to get a cheetah for you. And that might maybe make us change our feeling or our treat on the pole between cheetahs, leopards and savocats on which one is the most beautiful one. I'm not sure what eagle is that. How far is that eagle there? Let me see whether I can get that. Is it too far, Chi? It's not in the very best place, but I thought before getting close to it, we might find out who she is and what she's doing. She's a tony eagle. Very good, Arch. Well done. It looks like a tony eagle to me. I don't know the Project Alpha is watching with 
is watching this evening. Let's try and get a little close up, but to me it looks like a Tony Eagle before she flies away. Anyway, oops, there she goes. Sorry, Achi. Well, the whole idea of coming around this area is to chance and see if we could see a cheetah. This is very good cheetah country, and the wildebeest have made the grass very short. The Thompson gazelles could be very comfortable in such area roaming. In several things, I'll tell you, you'll see snakes anywhere. You could be walking or you could be in the car and bump into a snake. It depends on the time of the day and also it depends on the type of the snake. So it could be any time and it could be anywhere. So you could just be driving with the car. You stopped the last time I think was four days ago when I saw a puff adder crossing the road and when to go right in the middle of the road, it decided to stop. So it could be any time of the day, it depends on where you are or what the snake could be doing. Some snakes always come out during the day, some at night. So during the day we see more puff adders, black mambas, pythons more at night than during the day. So this is very good country for cheetahs and I'd be happy if I could bump into a cheetah today before the day closes or before it gets darker. And I would be more than happy if we see a cheetah. Having seen the Savoca Talia and Tristan having Tingana, then if we spot the Savoca, the cheetah, it would be very exciting. But in the meantime, let's go back to Tristan with Tingana. Well, we are trying our very best to keep up with the Duke, but he's making life incredibly difficult because he's hugging this drainage line the whole way, which is making it really tricky for us to actually be able to kind of keep up with him through it. So he's now, as we kind of came from the northern side, because I thought he'd go north, he then kind of hugged the southern side of the drainage line. So we crossed the drainage line in the only spot that we possibly can. And I don't think we're going to get out of this right now. There we go. We're going to try and get ourselves out of this. There we go. Um, so we crossed to the southern side and then he went on to the northern side, which of course is what Tingana does. There he is. Oh, it is beautiful though this afternoon. Look at that. He's walking through this golden, golden grass at the moment, which is absolutely Isn't that wonderful? I think that's absolutely beautiful. Wow. Now, oh, sorry, Kirst, I was busy driving up the bank, so I didn't hear. Big Cat Love, how far can his calls go? Are we, I mean, are we referring to us as humans hearing it or as another leopard? For us as humans, we probably won't hear his call far beyond, I'd say about three kilometers would be a really good amount of sort of, well, distance. Um, so what's that? About two miles, I would say, where we would probably pick up his, his call from, but other leopards will probably be hearing him from as many as five miles away. Um, so it just depends whether you're a leopard or a human as to how far this kind of call radiates and how far you actually get it. But, oof. Right, now, we've got a male leopard on the move into the sunset. It sounds like David has, well, also gotten a spotty cat that is also on the move. Well, finally, finally, I have gotten what I was thinking I'd chance on, and luck has paid, looking around, Ideally, it's sometimes a question of luck or just knowing where to go. There are certain animals, you know their habitat. Cheetahs love open country like this. And there is the cheetah. I'm here to find out who she is. The two particular females we've been following in this area, one called Naratoi and another one called Kakenya. And I do not think she's either of those two. She looks a little bit younger to me. And if you look on the back of her neck she's still got lots of fur 
meaning she's a young cheetah. And I'm very happy of your excitement. And maybe this might make you change uh, your feelings earlier of, you know, which one you think is most, you know, is most colorful, the cheetah, the leopard, or the savocat. Let me move forward and I give you another view of this cheetah. Maybe she could be going for a hunt. No, no, not exactly. It's getting a bit dark for her, but I've seen cheetahs even hunting at this hour. So I want to turn around and she is on the move. And if she spots a Thompson gazelle, for example, I'll not be surprised if she chooses to go for one. So let me give you a different view. Ruby, I've seen her exactly like calling something. And what I would say, either she has caps, maybe, maybe not. But I also saw, yeah, yeah, a call. And if she's calling someone, she's definitely got some caps. I mean, having seen Sapo Katali and now seeing Cheetah, and maybe seeing her caps all together. Let me just move forward a little bit. Actually, are you happy there? All right. Because she seemed... Ruby, like she called out. I wasn't sure that's what she did, but let's see. And if she does call again, I will definitely say a hundred percent she got crabs around. See how majestic she walks? So I highly doubt this is Kenya and it's not Naruto either. She's definitely one thing is a fuck, she is a female. Tom, very good. You're saying Cheetah is the winner. Look at those spots there, Cheat. Uh, Tom, very good. Very good. That's a great comment. And for all the viewers who were with me before, uh, we earlier had Tingana the leopard, then we had the Savocat. Now we have been luckily or we have been able to find for you a cheetah. Should any of you want to change your mind, please let us know using hashtag Safari Live. The cheetah, the leopard, and the savocat, which has the most striking spot, or which is more colorful than the other. I spoke earlier about the tear marks of the savocat. If he is going to turn around and look at us, you'll see how different the tear marks are. There's a little bird there, it's a lapwing. You can hear, there's two of them there, you see them? Occasionally, cheetahs have been known to go for chicks. James Richard, you recall this is Kenya. While I might agree with you, I'm not as good as identifying cheetahs like, uh, I would say, lions and leopards in South Africa. But James Richard, you say it's Kenya. I will be with you for now. So let's get other viewers who have been following Kenya and tell us whether this is Kenya 100%. But James Richard, Asante Sana. Asante Sana, James Richard, translates to thank you very much. I'm going to move forward a little bit and maybe have a look at her face and see those black tear marks that I love on cheetahs. All right, Kakenya, tell me whether you are Kakenya or who you are. James Richard thinks you are Kakenya. Is it true? And if you're Kakenya, who are you calling? Were you calling caps or who were you calling a few seconds ago? Either you roll, you turn around there, give us a bit of action. In the background, you can hear the black crown lapwings. By the cheetah, they know cats, you know, including jackals, have been known to eat their eggs and their chicks on the ground. In the background, also, we can hear some nocturnal bats which are going bedding now saying good night and we'll be seeing the out tomorrow and that was not very good for her she didn't like that kakenya you are where are you focused on where are you looking kakenya the last day had you don't have any cubs i do not know who you are calling alia i don't know who you're looking at Dina, maybe, a Thompson gazelle. She's definitely looking around. I mean, they have hunted at night as much as they do a better job during the day in bright light. 
using their black tear marks. You can see the black tear marks there, like sunglasses to reflect the sun away. And sometimes they've been known to push the prey towards the sun. Nico Nico cheetahs, just like the Savo cat we saw earlier, will also hunt birds. Anything a cat will catch, they'll go for it. Lions too, leopards, they've been known to go, for example, for, you know, uh, guinea hens or, you know, guinea fowls. They'll go for weavers, any bird they can catch, any, any hatchlings on the ground that do not have any wings to fly, Nico Nico they'll eat birds. They're basically carnivores and anything they can easily catch. They'll normally choose anything that's easy for them to bring down and they'll not struggle to getting something that's hard to hunt. She's turning around. What I want to do, I also want to turn around. Let me make sure there are no rocks in front of me. As she turns, we look where she is going into and maybe find out who she was calling earlier. I have not heard of Kenya with caps. But again, you never know. Let's just turn around a little bit there. And she's going to walk right in front of us. And Archie, sorry, Archie, about that. Sorry, Kakenya. Hopefully, you're Kakenya. Debbie, that's another possibility. She could be calling a male cheetah. And Debbie would have found out it's more so the male cheetahs that they call females when it comes to mating. So it's a possibility she would have called a male cheetah earlier. She walks and then she stops. So let's just go around and first turn around and see where she wants to go. Okay, there she is. And the direction she is going to, I think, Whoever she was calling, that's where exactly she is headed to. Let's see if we can see her from there and find out where she has to go. But at least either she was calling a male or cubs, just thinking out of the box. Not very sure about that. And she's keeping the distance between us and herself. And you notice she looks black and white and not the normal colors of cheetahs because now we are infrared and infrared helps us not to be able to disturb the animals and interfere with them. And we're going to catch up with her until we know who she was calling. Right, Sachi? Let's find out. It's getting really dark here, but so long as we don't stay very far from her and also we don't get very close to her, we don't want to interfere with her plants and whatever she wants to do. I still got very good eyes. My headlights of the car are not on because I can still spot her. Vaguely, I can see the white spots, which comes out bad at night. And she'll lead us to whoever she was calling. The good thing now, the area we are on is flat and I can see easily a rock, unless I end up going into a hole. But so far, I would say, so good. All right, we're gonna stop here and find out what she wants to do. She's still walking on some old skeleton there. Someone might have been brought down there way back. Where are you going, Kakenya? But you can tell either she's focus, focusing on a prey or she is focusing on who she was calling. I'm gonna keep following you, Kakenya, but let's find out who Tristan is following. Well, we're busy following Tigana, but he's come out of this drainage now and is on the road, but I just want to try and see if I can get round him quickly. Sorry, we're in low range, so the car sounds like it's revving much higher than it actually is. Well, well not going that fast, should I say. Beautifully on the road with this most orange golden light. It's spectacular. Interestingly enough, though, this is the furthest west I've seen Tingana in many, many, many weeks. He's right up against the Balanites um, on the western side going towards Impala Plains, which is very far west for him after the last few months. We've hardly seen him walk in this direction. Now I'm hoping, theoretically, he should be wandering straight up towards us. Do you see him, David? Where has he gone? Oh, there he's coming. Okay, good. So he should be coming straight at us, which will be very, very nice. He's going to kind of use the road and hug the road towards us, which will be very pleasant indeed. 
And so I'm pretty sure, well, I'm hoping he's going to do that. Of course, he might just be tingling. Oof, he's being a pain today. Every time we get onto a road in front of him, he's doing this, which is quite annoying, if I'm honest. He keeps kind of messing with us, which is always a little bit tricky. So let's see. We might just be wanting to scent mark that log, and then he might turn back towards us. Let's just play it out and wait for him. But theoretically, he's going to definitely send Mark and he's sniffing around all over the place. What's interesting about this is that this is an area where Shadulu often hangs around and we know Hukumuru used to walk around here a lot and so I wonder if he's picking up Shadulu's scent for the first time which would be very interesting because maybe that's going to drag him deeper into Arethusa but he's walking very far west for Tingana that's for sure. Teddy, no, not as far as a lion's roar. So leopards don't have the same vocal ability that lions do. They will have a much smaller roar or much less sound that comes out of them, just a much smaller body than what lions do. Right, David, let's just quickly position ourselves because he's going to go to the big Balanites. Tingana, not sticking to the script today at all at this stage. He's just on his own kind of leopard mission, which I suppose is fine. Um, Right, now we're going to keep following Tingana because he's just strolling through the thickets but it sounds like David up in the Mara is still with Kikenia and it sounds like she might have spotted something. Well, Tristan, the leopard whisperer, please keep following Tingana. Don't lose him until the very end of the show. And I'm following Kikenia here and that to me looks like a stalking mood. Not very sure. We have seen cats behave like that and then not doing what we think they're doing. But she's walking, stopping, looking. And I might not be surprised if she's looking at some Thompson gazelle from a distance. Not that I can see any, it's just too dark. And as I told you earlier, we are now in infrared. And the whole idea of infrared is to make sure we do not influence in any way or shape or form behavior of these animals that are more diurnal than nocturnal but once in a while if maybe she didn't make to get herself some prey during the day she might try one at night before it gets too late just watching there looking not sure exactly what she wants to do so let me just move forward a little bit and see what she wants to do without getting so close to her I don't want to put my spotlight, spotlight light on as yet because if she's hunting, I do not want to give her any advantage for the prey. I want her to do what she's just supposed to do for herself because that way she's going to keep her hunting skills all her life. The moment... James Richard, you being an expert, if you've done your comparison well, it's too dark for me where I am. So to the viewers, James Richard thinks this is Naratoi, not Kakenya. Well, James Richard, I'm still with you. You got my back because I know you've been following these cuts very well and I respect your judgment and how you've been able to identify these cuts. Now, Naratoi, I'm sorry for having called you Kakenya before. I'm giving a different name. So that's going to be a new name for now. But what are you exactly planning to do? That position is not very normal for cheetahs unless they're planning something. And the only thing I would imagine is you are laying ambush. Maybe to get yourself some dinner before it gets too dark. One of the challenges for her is maybe to sprint for a long distance because it's too dark. And in the process of doing that in the darkness she might sprain her feet or she might fracture herself hello there Naratoi so you have to be sure of what you're doing it's not too dark for her because I can see her you know in my naked eyes without using any spotlight of course in the infrared I got a feeling she's seeing much better than me and either she's focused on something that I cannot see from where I am 
And the only thing I would think she's looking at now is a Thompson Gazelle. While these planes of the Maasai Mara Triangle are full of Thompson Gazelles, Impalas, Grand Gazelles too. But with the choice of the three, cheetahs will always go for Thompson Gazelles. They're much smaller and I would guess much tender for them. Better fillet sticks than the Grunts and the Impalas and maybe easier work for them to bring down. I was talking earlier of like most cats will always get the easiest prey, they'll always take the easiest route to their prey, just not complicating their life. Impalas are much bigger than Tommy's, grounds are also much bigger than Thompson gazelles, so I don't see any reason why he should go for bigger prey if he has a choice of a Thompson gazelle. Look at those eyes. And Archie is trying to find out what he is looking at. But the farthest of all infrared can take us is that darkness. But to me, she must be spotting something. At the moment, she is not calling. And not many times I can remember when I saw cheetahs hunting in the darkness. We have always seen them until darkness falls. And then we go home back in the camp, come back the following day and very early in the morning and we see them with kills and when we try to judge maybe when they hunted we have always found out it's not that early morning it must be the previous night when we left them so if they miss a hunt during the day i'll say they more likely hunt before it gets too late in the darkness unlike hunting in the morning where lions have always been known to hunt more in the mornings if they miss something during the day now, i'm just going to move two more meters forward and then just rest there and then find out and there she is on the move even before i moved i'm going to follow her very quietly finding out where she will end up going but in the meantime the leopard whisperer tristan is still with tingana we are still with tingana david and he's being very very mobile this afternoon something's got a bee in his bonnet and he's salivating and staring and walking with purpose you can see look at him and he keeps stopping and looking i mean he's obviously got some impalas that have been shouting at him because he walked straight into them but there's definitely purpose to his walk and there's a lot of liquid coming out of his mouth and yes he is panting a little bit because he's moving quite fast but it's more than normal and so i wonder if he hasn't smelt somebody and is irritated by somebody's presence in this area or He's realized he's neglected this area for quite some time and it's time to just stamp his mark once again. So we're going to try and keep up with him. He is going to go into a pretty horrible area. There's going to be a lot of thickets here. But this is definitely the furthest west I've seen Tingana in a very, very long time. It's not to say he hasn't walked here. Obviously, we spend only a very small percentage of our time with these leopards in terms of their entire sort of life. Um, but to be honest, I don't recall once following tracks for Tingana in this direction. Certainly don't recall him sawing from here or seeing him here in the last few months. So it really is a long way from his normal kind of haunts that we've been seeing him. And it's a good sign. It means that he's still kind of in it to try and dominate and to try and kind of still be the aggressor in this particular area. And I wonder if maybe it's either maybe Hukumuri or Shadulu's scent that he's picking up and that's why he's walking into this section. Now we've got to be very careful in this area because lots and lots of artfark burrows that come our way so one needs to be a little bit careful that we don't end up falling down one or a car disappearing in one. We'll have to just be a little bit careful but look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It's a prime example of a big male leopard. Love my well, if successful in terms of the mating, um, you'll find that that female theoretically should have cubs in about nine, well, what are we now? We're well over, so probably 88, maybe 84 days, 84 to 88 days from now, she should have um, cubs. If that is that the second one was successful, if the first one was successful, which I doubt that it was given that she mated again, of course, sometimes they will mate even if they've had a successful mate. Um, 
mating before they sometimes do it again for some reason but I doubt that it was successful given how long she mated the second time it was almost four or five days that they mated um, so if successful like I said about eight given the time frame about 80 sort of four to 88 days from now theoretically we should have little cubs from that female but <laughs> the chance of finding that female on a den it's going to be very, very, very tricky. I don't think you're going to find that den very easily. The only way you would find that den is if you are exceedingly lucky. I mean, you look at Tundi, how we struggled to find her den at time, and she's a relaxed female. Now, you add an unrelaxed element to it, you're going to be looking a lot for that female and her den size, and I think it's not going to be an easy one to find. But, you know, one always has to hold out hope. Sometimes you'll get lucky, and you will find it, and, and you know, that'll be a good thing. I think the, the trick with her would probably be to find her um, on a kill and then follow her back to the cubs. That would probably be the only way, but the chances of finding her and following her back to a, a, a den is probably zero, given her nature and how she tries to kind of stay away from the cars. I don't think she would lead you back to her den in any respect at all. So, unfortunately, uh, the chances of us seeing those cubs is probably quite slim until they're a little bit older and they're actually on carcasses and we find her with them on a carcass. That would be my guess. What I, I secretly, I'm hoping that she does find, or that Tingana finds Shadulu talking about kind of mating, because I think it would be really cool to find him mating with her. Um, Hukumuri's had his shot, and so far has not managed to really do much in terms of impregnating any of the females he's mating with. Oh, look at the sky. So we've got a leopard there, and we've got this glowing kind of sunset that is coming off from the, the left-hand side over the mountains. So that's what we kind of, is the backdrop drop to this Tingana sort of walking through the arid bush which is very very pretty so we super fortunate there's a bit of scent marking going on Tingi are you laying claim once again to your western boundary I wonder if he's gonna go into Arethusa tonight be a big move if he has I I don't know of anyone who's seen him on Arethusa since before he got well before he got ill so when, when was that January somewhere around there I think is the last sighting of Tingana on that side of the world so it just gives you an idea of how long it's been since he's been in this area and there must be something that's driving him to walk like this is you know leopards don't all of a sudden decide hang on I'm gonna go way out of where I have been and just go and push into a new section so I wonder if maybe just maybe the scent of a female in estrus is pulling him this way and making him come and check out what's going on on this side. You know, we know that Tingana normally snaps up the girls. He's very good at mating and, and has been very successful actually in many respects with producing litters. Maybe the litters haven't always survived, but he has produced. You look how he's smelling. He's definitely got his nose to the air. Something is intriguing Tingana in this area. He's got his nose up, he's sniffing, he's smelling trying to work out what's on the wind and which direction his nose needs to take him. Maybe we're going to be taken to a carcass. We also know how he's very good at finding those. So could be that too. Um, but he's definitely gotten much quieter. He's not sawing like he was earlier. Um, and so he's kind of nose down and just sniffing and, and looking and walking with quite a bit of purpose. He's covering a lot of ground quite quickly. If you think that we were kind of at Philemon's dip and we are already in this area and he hasn't really been walking for that long, it just goes to show that he's not being shy about covering ground this evening. Right. Now, we are going to have a torrid time in this block. The way that Tingana is walking is the worst possible way that he could have gone. So we're going to try and keep up with him and see if we can. While we do that, though, let's send you across to David, who's also trying to keep up with his cheetah. Well, when a leopard decides to be on the move, they can move and they can cover such a long distance, cover much ground walking, depending on where they're going to look for food. And the same case this cheetah has been doing here until she stopped now on that Taman Mount. I've been able to identify that what she's looking at are Thompson gazelles. There's a good sizable herd of 20, 30 odds Tommies or Thompson gazelles. And that's what she's focused on. My guess is she might choose to go for a young one. And I was saying earlier, the dangers of cheetahs hunting at night, unlike lions or leopards, they may not be able to see very well. And they tend to incur so many 
injuries when they try to run and they end up on boulders or holes or dens of warthogs or advocs. So where she is now that turret mount, she's a bit raised compared to the Tommies that I would say that's still quite a distance from where she is. So she has to be very careful. And they think the only thing she may have to do is to get as close as possible, unlike during the day, when they can cover a good, say, 80, 90, 100 meters on a run. Here, I think she wants to shorten the distance as much as possible to reduce, you know, the risk of getting hurt should she miss the hunt. Or if she's lucky to get the hunt, she also wants to limit the damage on her feet. She keeps looking. The wind is picking up now. You can see how that plant is being blown by the wind and the grass. Not sure that's helping the cheetah, but I think it does more harm to the Tommies than the cheetah. The cheetah, that might be an advantage to her. Because from what I can see, the wind is blowing towards the cheetah. She's up. And she's just walking in intent. She stops. Debates. She has a decision to make. She turns around. She sits down. Do you have any Tommies walking towards you? That's the hunting behavior of lions. Unlike cheetahs, cheetahs will spot their prey stalk a little bit and then just sprint and try just to hug them down but again as I say because of the concern of the darkness and the cheetahs know this pretty well they do not want to incur any injury otherwise a cat that can't run and most of a cheetah doesn't sound very good they need their feet for speed that's the first weapon for cheetah either for defense or for taking food home or feeding themselves. Thank you, James Richard, again. Narato, we agree it is. Up. She is looking. Not anything I can see myself. But I would want to believe most cats, including cheetahs, would maybe see better than us as human beings. M1 Kai cheetahs are definitely faster than human beings in general. In general, they're faster than human beings. And I'm not trying to talk of the exception of some of athletes that were very, very fast, who trained very well. But an average speed of a human being, I would say. Oh, sorry, I missed that. And yes, I would say cheetahs are more active during the day than at night. Cheetahs are more active during the day than at night sorry about that and i want to move forward and see how the only advantage at night the temperatures drop considerably and they're able maybe to do uh, a lot of walking a lot of moving when it's not very hot many cats you know they don't like heat so i would say che cheetahs are more diurnal than nocturnal i like leopards that are both so oh, Chit is still walking and getting very close to those Tommies that we saw earlier. So I'm gonna move forward and not get very close. And I don't want to keep shining my light towards the Tommies or towards the Cheetah. Let me first just stop here and see whether she's still on the move or she has decided to stop. He's still on the move and with a lot of intent. So yeah, I would say they are more active during the day than at night. But like any other cats, if the opportunity is going to avail itself at night and she wasn't very lucky during the day, I would say why not? But not very late. Anything after 9, 10 o'clock, uh, definitely, she'll definitely have to stop, slow down, keep home for the night, bed, until tomorrow morning when she may go for another chance of a hunt. So I'm going to move forward a little bit again and find out where these tummies are and the distance between her and the Thompson Gazelles. Well, let's very quickly go to Sydney in South Africa.
I am still around the Galagopen area looking for Hosanna here. There's just quite a lot of bad calls at the moment. I'm trying to investigate these bad calls in order to see if we are going to be lucky with this uh, lovely spotted cat here. So the grey lorries, the go away birds were calling somewhere in this area just now. Maybe we might be lucky here. Nico Nico, uh, Hosanna is going to grow that very big. Maybe even much bigger than Hosanna. You know, even much bigger than Tingana. So I can promise you that that uh, cat is growing very quickly and is looking very healthy. Or maybe he will start to lose weight when starting to become a territorial holder because the title of being a territorial holder comes with quite a huge responsibility. <laughs> So here is where the birds were calling from, and I am not seeing anything. So the bush is very much more open here, so I'm not seeing him at all. But here, hopefully, he is somewhere in this area. So I'm hoping to meet him somewhere here. So now let's go to David. He's got an amazing sighting of cheetah hunting. So maybe the cheetah's gonna catch something tonight. Well, good luck, Sydney. You may be lucky to see Hosanna. And the cheetah here is moving towards the Thompson Gazelle. So let me just reposition myself and see what exactly she wants to do. If she decides to hunt, we might be lucky to catch that hunt. It's quite unusual to see them hunting this late, but if she's not lucky during the day, and this is the time she thinks she has better chances of hunting, why not? So we're gonna first stop here very quickly and see her direction. Actually, if you move to the left a little bit. Oh, she got something. She just got something right now. She just got something. Let me get close there. She just hunted in the, in the middle of the darkness. She just hunted right here, Archie. That's good, I've tried to down, Nisha. Oh, if you look here, Archie, she just got something right here. Can you see it, Archie? She just got herself something. And there she is. She's just choking the Thompson Gazelle. How lucky. It took seconds for us to miss the cheetah and getting herself some food. How epic, how exciting is this? I said it really happens, but once in a while, we have seen them hunting at night and this is one of those nights well done actually for framing it right there i think the cheetah took the words out of my mouth and i said most likely now she might be getting very close to the thompson gazelles we looked we missed her and then because our infrared can go very far we don't want to shine any light on her and the next thing I had was like someone being strangled and unfortunately is this Thompson Gazelle. For any of you who might be a bit squeamish, I might request you to turn away or switch off your TV or just look something else. And let's go across to, uh, to Tristan who has Tingana and it might be stroking something, could be one hunt to another hunt. Indeed, he's just spotted a small diker that is moving off from his sort of front to his right, a little bit more to the right of that, it is where it was last, the last time I saw it. Um, he's obviously now decided, nope, not going to be hunting that. So something is not food related is what Tingan is busy with this afternoon because he's literally just completely ignored that like uh, he kind of saw it and then just decided well i'm going to carry on now we're going to try and keep up with him and the next little section we're going to go through is not going to be pleasant you'll see david is going to have to move a tree so you might see a tree kind of moving on either side of me at the moment and that's because we're trying to get kind of squeezed through this little 
thicket. The problem with this area is that as you get around a tree, then you've got yourself a big aardvark burrow to worry about. And then around the aardvark burrow is a monkey orange, and then there's a stump, so it's really not an easy place to drive, particularly at night. So I'm hoping he takes us out of this by the time night really falls. Well, Sylvia, it's because aardvarks are generally only out mostly at night um, and we don't drive around at the times that the aardvarks are out and because we're not around that much, it also means that they are a little bit shy and reclusive and so they hear this hunking, great, noisy vehicle coming and they just decide to themselves, well, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to get out of here long before that happens and that's why we very seldom see them. So even though there is a lot of evidence of them, very seldom do we see them because of it. Oh, there's a beautiful full moon that is rising now as well. If only Tingana had gotten up a nice big marula, that would have been quite nice. I don't know if it's quite full moon. It might be full moon tonight actually. Let's just try to get forward and I can be able to show you what I'm talking about because we should get a really nice gap on it fairly shortly. Hold on David. Somewhere maybe a little bit further forward maybe. Oh come on. There we go. So there's a view of the full moon coming up in the distance. Look at that. Isn't that spectacular? So we had a beautiful setting sun and now we've got a full moon that's also rising on the eastern boundary and so that is absolutely spectacular. You see a bit of colour still from the sun and there's a few sort of clouds that are just in front of it that's giving it a sort of misty appearance. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, as much as I like looking at the moon, Tingana is going to lose us in two seconds if we don't keep up with him. I don't know what bee is in his bonnet, but whatever it is, it's making him move rather quickly through here. He's already probably 50 meters ahead of us in just that short space of time. Isn't it incredible how fast they can negotiate these areas? You know, it takes us a while to kind of get through here and to kind of twist and turn. Obviously for a leopard, much easier just to walk through. And you see it when you walk yourself, if you walk through these areas, you often can cover ground quite quickly in comparison to an off-roading vehicle because you can just kind of get through these thickets. Now, it is that time of the afternoon where we get young inquiring minds that join us for the afternoon. So it is a very, very warm welcome to John C. Myers Elementary. I hope that you are all having the most wonderful day and that you're going to love being on safari with us this evening. My name is Tristan. On camera, I've got to David this afternoon. And remember that this is live and interactive. And so we want to hear all of your questions. And you can post your questions to um, your teacher and your teacher will then send them all the way to us. And at the moment, you can see we're with a beautiful big male leopard. He really is an amazing creature. These are one of the hardest cats to find out in Africa. Leopards like to be shy and they like to hide away. But luckily, here in this particular part of the world, the leopards are quite relaxed and we get these abilities to view them in their natural habitat, which is so special. Now, this big male, what he's doing at the moment is he's on a patrol. And what that means is that he's going around and he's marking his territory. So he's going to be spraying urine and calling from time to time to make sure that all the other leopards in this area know that he is the big boy and that there's nobody else is allowed here. So he's chasing all the others basically away by his chemical scent that he's leaving behind in the form of his weed, as well as his audio in terms of his roar that he's going to let out which we term a saw out here they make a sound that sounds like somebody sawing wood and so that's why it's called a saw um and we hopefully are going to let he's, he's going to do one for us so you can hear it it's the best sound to hear for me particularly because this is my favorite animal so i love spending time with him Elijah, well, it depends where in the world you're seeing a leopard. Um, so here in South Africa, we have lots of different types of ecosystems, which means we have things like deserts and mountains, and then we have savannas like what we're in right now. Now, the savanna leopards um, will be the heaviest of the South African leopards. They normally weigh anywhere between 100 pounds for a female all the way up to almost 200 pounds for a male, so very, very big. Whereas in the mountain areas of South Africa, 
a lot of the males will only weigh just a, well, about 100 pounds, so the same size as a female in this area, whereas the females will be very small and sometimes they only weigh as much as 50 pounds, even less sometimes. So they really are a lot smaller um, in those areas and so it just depends on where they occur. But a really big male leopard like this guy would be probably, I would say, in the region of 200 pounds. Um, that would be considered a very large male. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to just get alongside him a little bit so I can show you the beautiful full moon and him walking alongside it. Let's see, there we go. Oh, it's going to be quick. So there we go. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? There's the full moon and a male leopard walking in front of it. Isn't that spectacular? How spoilt are we this evening? You're very lucky to see leopards. They are one of those animals that everybody comes to Africa to try and find, and it's a difficult animal to find, so we're being super spoilt. Now, there's another type of animal out here in Africa that can sometimes be tricky to find down here in South Africa, but my friend David, all the way up in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, well, he's on the open grasslands, and he's got a cat that loves to spend time where it's nice and open. Well, good evening, or is it a very good morning to you boys and girls of John C. Mayer's Elementary School. Welcome to our drive. We are in a country called Kenya, and we're in a game reserve called the Mara Triangle. We now got a cheetah that's feeding, and Alia, you are watching. Sorry about that, it could be a bit noisy there. You are Alia watching some leopard with Tristan. But now we have another cat here, and this one is a cheetah. And how exciting for you to be on board with us. My name is David, and with me also today is Archie on the camera. Very nice to have you, and I would say you're very lucky boys and girls to see a leopard in South Africa, and going like over 2,000 miles to see a cheetah. Well, Dasha, cheetahs ideally we got three big cats, I would say, in Africa. Cheetahs, the leopard with Tristan, and we also got lions. In general, if cheetahs see people in a car, like now, they're fine and they're comfortable. But if you would be out of the car walking, they will tend to go away from you. But if you go so close to them, they might attack you. Well, boys and girls, remember, you are more than welcome to ask us questions. If you have an interesting comment you'd want to give me or Tristan of Sydney, you can do that through your teachers. Now, this cheetah just brought down an antelope for dinner. You nearly, this cheetah, as I was saying a few seconds ago, just brought down this antelope. And the antelope it brought down is called a Thompson gazelle. And you can see how busy she is feeding on her. Now, cats tend to see better at night than human beings. And they do not have night vision, as some people would use at night to see better. So all the animals here in Africa, they live naturally and be they leopards or cheetahs, they do not have any night vision. But, nearly, I would say, they see better than us. One big difference between cheetahs and leopards is the spot that you see on the body, spot that you call rosette. And if you look at this cheetah carefully, she got spots on her body. Now, she keeps eating, stopping, and looking. And the reason she is doing that is she is worried other bigger predators or other bigger animals do not come and snatch her food. I'm talking about leopard, leopards like the one with Tristan, or even other bigger predators like lions or even hyenas. Because cheetahs are all, in general, they're very gentle cats, very easy, you know, to live, you know, or do their things. But when other bigger cats like lions and leopards come, they would easily snatch her food. See how busy she is eating? More often than not, cheetahs hunt during the day. Question, James is asking. 
but more often than not, they'll hunt at night. Once in a while, they'll hunt at night. And if you look on their eyes carefully, you see there's nothing there. It's just because of the reflection we are getting from infrared. But ideally, there's nothing on the eyes. That's just not so natural, and that's how the eyes should be naturally. But because it's at night, they tend to reflect and shine as she's looking at us. She must be a very hungry cheetah and having done such a big job, she is feeding and she has to eat very quickly because once the hyenas sense the smell, you'll notice the hyenas will come and try and snatch her food. Now let's find out what Sydney has for you boys and girls. A very, very good evening and welcome to the beginning of the school drive. I am Sydney Fumran Mikosi and I am with Senzo, who is my camera operator here this evening. Uh, my plan this evening is quite very easy. Uh, kids, I will be looking for the spotted cats for you. I hear that uh, you have already been explained very interesting stories about the difference between lepers as well as the cheetahs uh, by David. I am here by the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park and I'm hoping to find a lot for you. And please ask your teachers to ask us questions. I'm hoping to be interacting with you a lot this evening. Early at the moment, uh, the rain is not too much. Yes, last week we have just received a little bit of rain and uh, we are still hoping for the rain to come. Yes, the bush is very, very dry at the moment. So I've just heard some birds making some noise now. I want to just quickly go there and investigate what these birds are complaining about. So far, I am not hearing anything or seeing anything, but it seems like things are happening somewhere very close by. So this... Alfred, the scorpions, we do have them, and it's quite a lot of scorpions everywhere here in Southern Africa. When you come to where I am, you won't see much during the day because they, they rest, they go underground, they live in tunnels, and some of them, they also stick against the trees, just by the back of the trees, dead trees, they prefer them the most. We do have a lot of scorpions here. So I've just arrived at the nearest water hole where the noise was coming from. I am not seeing anything here and this is the place where all the animals come for drinking, both the animals that eat grass and the animals who feed on animals that eat grass, the predators, predators such as the leopards. Predators are those animals who hunt other animals for their survival. So when, a, when the birds are calling, so when the birds are calling is when they are giving kind of alarm calls that there's something in the area, maybe a predator. But now let's see one of the predators at the moment. Well, yes, we've got one of our predators at the moment. You can see we've got this big male leopard and he's just marking territory. So he's scraping his feet and urinating in order to try and just kind of leave a scent trail for any other leopard that moves here. You can see the moon in the background and him just slowly kind of coasting through. Now, a leopard rarely gets active at this time of the night. They are known as crepuscular animals. So what crepuscular means is animals that are active at dawn and dusk and that around that time. So this is the perfect time for a leopard. They camouflage incredibly well and 
so now at this time if it moves through these thickets it's the perfect time not only to be walking around without being seen by prey animals but also it allows them to do a lot of scent marking in the cooler parts of the day it's very hot during the day here in Africa and so with the animal that's got a big fur coat it's not very pleasant to be walking around so you'll find that they walk around more at night when they're marking territory because they're very very active and that means that they've got to try and kind of keep cool and so walking now is better than walking in the sort of middle of the day when it's warmer right now how are we going to get through here there's lots of stumps around so off-roading is quite tricky in these areas and it's why we're kind of struggling to keep up with them in many respects Anna, what type of things do leopards eat? Well, leopards will eat all kinds of things. So they have probably the widest array of food items out of any of the predators that we get here in Africa. And so they will go after things like insects even, so termites, um, all the way up to mice and rats. And then they go all the way through the, all the antelopes that we get out here even up to baby rhinos baby hippos and baby elephants so they hunt very big things as well as very small things so anything they can get really they will go after as well as they'll even scavenge now that means that they'll find anything that's dead already they'll also eat so you know they do go after many different things in their life and and you know one of the their favorite animals that they eat out here in the sabi sands is a thing called an impala now i'm pretty sure we're going to see an impala shortly because i can hear one shouting at this leopard so while I try and catch up with him we'll probably see the impalas shortly in this area and those are the things that leopards really love to eat they like to look for impalas where they can then go after them and hunt them it's a really nice size meal for a leopard you'll be able to eat that and get a really decent amount of food out of it now oh, where's he gone it looks like he's gone off to my right here so I'm gonna have to try and find a way through it's very thick in here and it's very difficult in night. Right, let's try and get through this side. So while we try and find a way through this thicket and see if we can make it through, let's send you back across to David in the Mara who's still with his cheetah as it eats its meal. Boys and girls, I'm sure you have learned a lot about leopards and you just had they eat a lot of meat and the cheetah is the same so cheetahs just like leopards will always hunt for their food and they either hunt antelopes sometimes they even hunt small baby animals like you know from zebras or from wildebeest but this particular one here is eating an antelope called thompson gazelle now there's a bit of a big difference between cheetahs and leopards. Duck, well, for these cats to be able to be effective when they hunt, because when they give the chase, they need to grasp the ground very well using the clothes, so they need to go like that. But the most important part is when they need to hug the prey down. The clothes must be sharp and they must be out. Otherwise, without clothes, they'll not be able to do that. So once in a while, you'll see them on trees and you'll see them just scratching trees like that. Not because their clothes are itchy, it's just because they're trying to sharpen their clothes. That's how they sharpen their clothes, to keep them sharp always when they go and hunt their food. So this cheetah, when she you know left running we never saw her actually running and then she brought this thompson gazelle down she very quickly brought her down like that using their clothes there she is still feeding on her thompson gazelle alexia of the two cats leopards and cheetahs Cheetahs are the fastest. I would say leopards do half the speed of cheetahs. Of all the animals in the world, Alexia, cheetahs are the fastest. And they can comfortably do about 70 miles in an hour. Can you imagine, Alexia? They just run like a small cow. I was talking of the differences between feeding habits of cheetahs and leopards. Now, if she eats this Thompson gazelle or antelope she is eating and she's full, chances are she might wake up and go and leave it. Leopards will keep eating the same meal maybe a day, two 
or three days until it starts smelling. Cheetahs will always want to eat fresh food. That's the number one difference between feeding habits of cheetahs and leopards. But another important habit is when leopards hunt and they get a kill, they tend to drag their food up on top of a tree and they'll always eat on top of a tree. Cheetahs in general will always eat on the ground. So the two major differences between feeding habits of cheetahs and leopards, apart from the other habits or the other differences in terms of spots in their bodies and leopards being more nocturnal than Diano, cheetahs are more Diano. Now let's go back to, to the cheetah and find out whether she's still enjoying her meal. She'll make sure she eats enough before she leaves it. And as I said earlier, she has to eat very quickly, making sure before the hyenas pick the smell of this Thompson gazelle, she'll be full. Now because it's still very fresh, the smell is not out there, number one, and then two, it's at night. James' biggest concerns for cheetahs operators are leopards, lions, and hyenas. Those are the main concerns for cheetahs. Of all the cats we have in Africa, these are the smallest, and the biggest worry will be leopards, hyenas, and lions. I would say me for more. Of course, depending on who is close to her. If they're hyenas, then definitely she'll be very worried of hyenas. But if lions happen to be close, they smell her kill, they'll walk straight to her, and the cheetah, unfortunately, will just wake up and go away. Very rare we see cheetahs attacking other predators but they are always attacked by the other animals. So she has to eat very quickly, and as I said earlier, she'll eat, pose, wake up, look around, just making sure there's nobody coming to her. I'm not sure I got to your question, Napolia. Please bring it again, Casti. She's still eating, I guess. Victoria, not sure I got your question exactly, but cheetahs will hunt anything they get. Sorry, Casti, it's a bit windy now, and I got the name of the kid, uh, the student's Victoria. What was her question again, sorry? Well, Victoria, I enjoy talking about wildlife in Africa cheetahs not being exception and especially when you see them eating like this victoria it's always fun and i talk to all the children all over the world not only say out there in america but even here in africa or in europe i like educating kids and telling more or telling them stories about animals and you just saw this cheetah hunting and eating this particular thompson gazelle it's always interesting to explain to the kids, see how she's pulling it up. Maybe now she wants to eat the other side of the belly. And when they start eating, they'll always start with hindquarters because that part is always a bit soft. And then they will go maybe to the internal organs, but they'll have eaten from the hind legs, which have lots of meat. To open the inside is a bit difficult and not so much flesh on the internal organs or the stomach content. So they tend to go to the hind legs. And there they get lots of flesh. So if the hyenas would come like now, I want to believe she has eaten so much and she is quite full. Maybe any time now she might stop eating, but we'll continue watching her as she enjoys her dinner. But Sydney has his spotlight on, and let's find out if she might be lucky to show you something different. <laughs> I have got my spotlight out at the moment to try and find these animals that are more active now at night. So this spotlight helps me because I can be able to see their eyes shining from very far. The 
Jaden, it is very, very safe here where I am. So these animals, they don't just attack vehicles and they don't just attack people. So when seeing us, every time I can see there's something here. Uh, a small animal. Look at that. Can you see that? So there's a very a small animal standing there at the moment. So we are very much safe uh, because these animals, when seeing us all the time, they don't get aggressive. They don't worry about us. They just see us as part of the car. They don't. They cannot distinguish between this car and myself. Look at that. So that is one of the animals that are much more active during the night. And this is a female because it doesn't have horns. This is called a diker. A deka is an animal which feed on leaves. So the animals that feed on leaves, we call them browsers. So they are much more now active at night. But to be active at night is not nice because it's when the predators, those that hunt, are much more active. So these animals are the animals who are on high risk. So I can see that that deka uh, got disappeared now. Uh, brain and and it's not it's never easy for us to get scared because we are very used to these animals yes at the beginning of this job uh, it's very much scary especially when coming across the predators for the first time so i'm going to have my spotlight on again Uh, Chloe, the most common animal that I see the most here, it is the impala. Every day I am seeing the impalas, but the most predator, the, one of the animals who hunt the impalas that I'm seeing the most here is the leopard. So I am seeing the leopards on uh, almost every day. So on several occasions, leopards, we are having the sightings of them. And I'm hoping to find one tonight. So now let's go back to Tristan and see where he's going at the moment. Well, we're still trying to keep up with our male leopard, but he's left us. He's decided to kind of just disappear somewhere here. So we're just trying to see what's going on. He was kind of started to trot away from us. And I wonder if he smelt something or saw something. So what we're trying to do is just check ahead of where we thought he might come out. But so far, no sign. Now, I know that this morning we had a Nyala carcass. So that is a type of antelope. We had a dead one that was taken by hyenas to a hyena den, which is not far from here. So I wonder if he might have smelt that. And that's why he's in this area and he's now run off to that direction. That's what I maybe thought was going to happen because I've been looking for him on the road and I don't see any sign of his tracks. The last time I had him was right here. So he was kind of just ahead of us and I tried to get round to find him again and then he just disappeared on me. So I don't quite know where he's gone. I'm just trying to check the road for any sign of his feet. Okay, so Maddie, Ella, Peyton and Sadie, you want to know what is the grossest thing I've ever seen? Hmm, um, I don't know actually, I've got to think about this one, because there's lots of things that we see out here that can sometimes be quite disgusting, um, but I want, I've seen a leopard um, the one time eating the intestines of an impala and as it was eating the poop was coming out of the intestines which was pretty gross so that was not very pleasant at all I've also seen lions eating a giraffe that was probably about two weeks old and the giraffe was green and really smelly and the meat was almost like liquid because it was so rotten and the lions were almost drinking the giraffe rather than actually eating it it was very gross 
gross. So that was pretty disgusting. Um, what else have I seen that's very gross? Now we're just going to go past a car. We're on the main road that goes to the camps and so there's sometimes a little bit of traffic in this particular area. Now I'm just looking around to see no, no sign of our male leopard here. I wonder where he went. Um, what else was gross that I've seen? Um, lots of things, I suppose. There's lots of things with animals eating other animals. Um, I've also seen, oh, well, now this is probably one of the grossest things actually I've seen, is that out here, lions go to the toilets, right? And normally when they go to the toilets, it's after a big meal. And a few years ago, we had a drought, and that means that it was very, very dry around here. And so lots of buffalo were dying. Now the buffalo were very, very bad condition. And so there were a lot of carcasses that were just left for a few days in the hot sun and they got very rotten. And some of the lions would eat those carcasses. And so the one day there was a lion who went to the toilet and he had not a very healthy tummy because he had big tapeworms in his tummy. And so when he went to the toilet, this long tapeworm, and when I say long, I say like this long, a tapeworm came out out of his bum and it was dragging on the ground for a while and then he took his teeth and he pulled it out and then he left it on the ground and a vulture came down and ate his poo and the tapeworm very gross that's not nice at all so I've seen lots of ugly things out here and so hopefully you don't get nightmares from the ugly things that I've seen. I probably shouldn't even be telling you these things because it's not very pleasant at all. But anyway, it's what happens out here in nature. Nothing goes to waste. And so the vulture ate the lion poo as well as the tapeworm, which was disgusting. So I was not very impressed with that sighting. It made me feel quite sick in my tummy, actually, because, you know, those kind of things are not very pleasant at all. So I believe all of you have written and said, so gross, I know, isn't it? It's very, very disgusting. But that's what happens out here. It's like I say, everybody kind of makes sure oh, he's come out, he's run across. So he did go across. Okay, so we just missed him. I think I know where he's going. So we're going to try and head off there quickly because I see his tracks have gone across the road and I think he's going to exactly where that carcass is. So we're going to try and just quickly head that direction. Now it's quite dangerous where he's going because it's a place where hyenas have their little babies and if he sees the babies he might try and kill them but the adults might be there and then they're going to chase him. So we're going to try and get there quite quickly because I'm pretty sure that's where he's running towards is to try and get to that carcass but I think there's going to be some impalas in the way hold on let's see now but he will be long way ahead of us by now because of kind of the time it took us to turn around so I'm going a little faster than I normally would try not to drive too fast out here at night because obviously things can walk across the road at any time like our leopard and we don't want to hit it so we've got to be a bit careful when we're driving but luckily we have a very powerful light so I can shine my light around and make sure that I don't hit our leopard. Now here's some impalas. This is a thing that a leopard loves to eat but I'm not going to stop too quickly here because I want to try and get past them to try and get towards where that carcass is because I think this leopard has run straight this way and is going straight towards where the Nyala is. That's what I'm believing. I might be wrong but we're gonna try. Let's see now so it would be a little bit further than where we are now. He should be if he was running and the wind is actually coming from this direction so his nose is very sensitive and he can smell these things and so that's maybe why he's moving quickly in this direction but hold on we're almost there there's more impalas they're all quiet at the moment so he hasn't come this direction he must have gone through the bushes on our left hand side here which would be the way that I would expect him to go where is the road? So Adam, leopards um, will live depending on male or female. So a male leopard generally only lives to be between sort of 12 and 14 years old because they fight so much with other leopards for territory and for girls and for food. And so they unfortunately get themselves into a little bit of kind of danger with that. And that's why they sometimes then get hurt and their body breaks down a lot quicker. But what you also will find is then in the females, because they're a little bit sort of less likely to fight with one another, they tend to live a little 
little bit longer and so you find that they'll live normally between 14 and 16 years old sometimes even as much as 1920 but that's very seldom and then if you have a leopard in a zoo or something like that which we don't really want leopards to be in zoos but if they are then they can live as much as sort of 21 22 years because they get a vet that looks after them out here these animals don't have that luxury and so they're not able to do it now let's just check here quickly I'm gonna just make sure that I turn off my lights because Draven a carcass is a dead animal so it is an animal that has died that has then so you see here's the hyena on my right hand side and I'm gonna show you now we're gonna park nicely so we can actually see where the carcass is so I can show you what a carcass really looks like there we go there's the carcass there it doesn't look like anything much at the moment because it's kind of all dead and has been eaten but that was what was once a antelope called a nyala so unfortunately that antelope has been eaten by lots of hyenas and dragged around and that's why it no longer really resembles an antelope anymore but I'm pretty sure this is where our leopard is coming so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go around because there in the distance is a hyena with its little one so on my right hand side is a hyena now we're having a little problem with our infrared light at the moment there we go so you see the little baby that's where the baby is now of course there's a leopard that might come this direction this mother would be very protective of that baby and will fight with that leopard and it's going to be very dangerous for that little cub as well as for even the leopard itself because a mother hyena is super protective and I'm pretty sure this leopard has smelt this carcass because it's not far from where we were and I'm pretty sure he's gonna run in this direction there we go now our IR light has come back on which is very good news so we can now see it you see look it's mom is just checking making sure that there's nobody coming this way the little one is also kind of in the burrow now normally we wouldn't spend time with these guys at night but because we've got a special light called an infrared light it allows us to see these animals in complete dark so now I'm not shining any lights on them which means I'm not affecting their eyes in any way at all now you'll see there's actually three of these little ones that are coming out you see that so there's one that's slightly older and then it looks like two of around the same age how cute are they they're very cute so this is the little hyena home that they're in now I don't actually know if I want to be here too much because even if a leopard comes here it could be dangerous and I don't want to block the view of this hyena in any way especially because she's got little ones but there's definitely two small ones there you see them look at that that's very very cute So two tiny ones and a third one that's a little bit bigger now those will be from different females so hyenas when they have their babies will only have two and the they will never have more than that so it's definitely from a second mom and the two hyenas that have been denning in this area have been oh, the two sort of top hyenas so they are what we call the matriarchs of this particular group so they're the ones that as far as we know are highest up in the food chain in, in hyena society most of the time a female will dominate the clan sometimes it can happen that a male is high up there but for the most part it's females and so we have two females called corky and pretty and they are the ones that have the little babies at the moment look at that isn't that sweet look how pretty that little one is it's super cute with its little legs very very cool and a little fat tummy too hey little ones now those ones probably are about I would say six to eight weeks old the small little brown ones they haven't got their spots yet and then you see look they're gonna come down and suckle now let's see if they're allowed to have some milk and then you've got another one that's slightly bigger which I would imagine is maybe closer to about 12 weeks old now that one's going to go and sit next to mom that's very special how cool is that very very lucky to be able to see these things and to be able to watch hyenas with their little babies it's always nice when an animal is relaxed enough to allow you an intimate view into their life and even in a place where they have their den site now so far no sign of this male leopard coming this way I'm just shining my light every now and then to our left to be able to see what's going on right I'm gonna spend probably two or three more minutes here just in case that mail comes but I don't want to actually be here too much because I don't want to disturb what's going on and so while we just kind of see what happens let's send you back across to Sydney with his spotlight a 
Oh, look at that. I have got the scrub here. So this is one of the very much uh, clever animals. Look at that. This animal is too fast. When the big animals are coming here, those who attack these kind of small animals, they can go very quickly. And every time when running away, you will see they raise up their tails and show very some white colors underneath the tail, which is there in order to show the others, let's go this side. Clever, isn't it? Look at those big ears. They can hear very, very well when they... So they can hear very, very well when something is coming, make use of these very big ears. So you can see that now is the time for the scrub here to feed. Look at that. You can see the grasses. They're eating from the bottom. So it's, it's not only one scrub here. Another one just got disappeared. There were two at the moment. Maybe they are staying as a family and protecting each other when they are feeding now. So they are so very clever, they're not even making noise when they are moving and jumping here. So these animals are active now during the night. So now let's go to David uh, with his cheetah by the Maasai Mara and see the beautiful spotted cat. So cheetahs can also take down a scrub hair. Well, unfortunately, it sounds like David unfortunately can't hear you guys, so you're back with us at the Hyena Den. I just saw some eyes glinting in the distance there, so I'm thinking that maybe this leopard might be coming. I can't see nicely what eyes they are, so I'm just watching. Now, the hyenas on my right-hand side are still very much asleep, and what you'll find is if a leopard comes in here, listen. growling at them but look at how sweet those two are now we only thought we only thought that there were two of them here but there's actually three little cubs which is super exciting but you can hear them little cackles that they're making they still haven't quite got their deep laugh that their moms will get look at those teeth as well isn't that sweet look how playful it is <laughs> that is very 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 cute i must be honest i always kind of like when we see little baby hyenas because everybody always thinks of hyenas as ugly horrible animals that steal things and they're dirty and they're not at all they're actually incredible animals that are quite clean and they look after themselves and they really have a tight family where they'll make sure that they protect their little ones as much as possible and they'll work together as a group to find food and they hunt just as much as a lion or a leopard even though people always think that they just steal everyone's food it's not actually the case they do hunt quite a lot and they find food for themselves quite regularly so they have a bad reputation but a very sort of unfounded reputation which means basically one that is not deserved they don't deserve to be labeled the way that they are they're incredible animals and incredible mothers and it's always nice when we go to a den because you can see how caring they are for their babies and just how cute they can be i mean look at those little faces aren't they sweet they look like a little teddy bear don't they So, Davin, they will eat any kind of meat. It doesn't matter what it is. So, they'll eat anything from lions to hippos to elephants. Um, anything. As long as it's meat, they will eat it. And it doesn't even matter if it's rotten. A hyena has an incredibly good stomach that it's able to be able to smell and to see and to, well, I mean, and uh, able to eat and then be, digest that horrible smelling food so they're able to kind of sort of deal with food that many other animals actually can't they're almost like a rubbish bin for meat out here and they very much needed because without them we would have a very 
very dangerous thing in that we would have meat that would lie around and things like maggots and disease would grow on that meat and then other animals would get very sick and might actually get killed so you know they need to be very careful about having carcasses lying around and so these guys are our cleanup crew with the vultures and they make sure that this place is really well looked after and that we don't have rotting carcasses lying all over the place now I can't see those eyes anymore they don't seem to be coming just yet but hopefully we'll kind of see something pop out at some point but at the moment it's just very special to watch these little ones playing around so that's uh, how much do hyenas weigh? A big female like this, well, she will weigh probably about 160 to 180 um, pounds, maybe even more than that. She can go over 200 pounds. Even very big ones like up in the Masai Mara, they are huge up that way. So, oh, look at that one. It fell over. It was running too far. <laughs> Did you see it was running too fast and it fell over? It's very cute. They're still trying to get their kind of running legs. They've got their walking legs and their running legs will come and they'll find that they'll run around this mound all day long and they can be very active and you'll eventually find when mom gets a bit kind of weary of what's going on she'll chase them inside the mound and then she'll leave and they know when she leaves that they mustn't move they have to stay exactly where they are otherwise they'll be in trouble so you'll find that when mom's tired and she wants to go looking for food that's when the little ones will be pushed and they'll have to go off on their own but you can see she's aware of something she's kind of listening and looking definitely that she knows that there's things that can come out at night and it's why she needs to be very protective of her little ones but look at how strong her neck and shoulders are these guys are phenomenally powerful animals they're able to you know break down bits of bone and, and skin and things that most of the other predators can't and I know a lot of people think that they're very ugly but I like hyenas I think they're very cool animals and they are super efficient at what they do so you know they have these powerful bodies and it's perfectly designed to be able to get the things that they need in order to survive but I wonder where our leopard went he definitely ran in this direction and you can see by the footprints on the road when we were driving is that he was definitely running his footprints made a big deep gouge on the road which means that he was moving quickly to try and get wherever he was going and so I, you know, the only way, the only place I think he could be heading would be here, unless there's another carcass somewhere else that we didn't know about that he was smelling and he's gone towards. Anyway, our hyenas, as you can see, are still sniffing the air. There's a little bit of a breeze that is blowing, and so that's why they're just smelling and trying to kind of see what's going on. Listen, you can just hear they're growling every now and then sometimes a little bit upset with the little ones and growls unfortunately though that's the end of our evening we're going to be starting to head home i hope that you guys had the most wonderful evening with us and that you enjoyed all the magnificent things from africa and that you will continue to think about animals and watch lots of lots of things and continue to kind of support animals in the hope that they all survive into the futures and maybe one day you'll be able to come out and see them also hope that you don't get too much homework today and that you have a really good day for the rest of our viewers that have been watching all afternoon it's been an absolute pleasure to have all of you hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow morning on our sunrise safari so from all of us thank you and good night